Hey everybody, thank you so much for tuning in to this episode of Last Born in the Wilderness. This is episode 200 of this podcast. Crazy, crazy. So before we jump into this episode, I just first want to lay out exactly what we're going to do with this thing. Because it is episode 200, because it is something of a milestone, I'm going to do something kind of like what I did when I reached episode 100, which is I'm not going to be interviewing any new people. There's going to be no new interviews in this episode. It's just going to be me and I'm going to be featuring some highlights, some segments of previous interviews that I have done that I want to tie together in kind of a a grand thing. I want to to follow the common thread between all of these different discussions and weave together something for you. And so if you're, if you're of course, you're looking for a new interview, I'm sorry, I won't have a, a new one here. But I just want to say before you go, if you decide not to listen to this thing, uh, I just want to say before you go that uh, I'm going to be taking several weeks off from doing this podcast, from releasing episodes and doing interviews and all of that uh, for about three weeks. So I'll be then releasing episodes again starting July 22nd. I decided to take some time off. And the reason why I'm going to be doing this is because I haven't taken a break from doing this podcast in, I think, over three years when I really started to get into this thing and and take it seriously and start interviewing people and releasing episodes every week and creating something like a system and a deadline for myself. And I have to say that I I really have been needing to do this for some time. Uh, There's a lot of things going on right now that I need to address in my life personally. Uh, Big changes have happened the past couple months, which have been rather challenging and difficult to work with and to process. And I'm not I'm not asking for anybody's sympathy or anything. I'm just sort of explaining that, you know, behind the scenes here, uh, things have gotten a little strange and a little difficult for me. So I wanted to wait, though, until I got to this episode 200 as sort of a uh, just sort of like a meaningful milestone and then take a little time away to reflect on what I'm doing here with this project and where I have gone. Um, and I just want to state before we jump into this episode, before we jump into this whole thing, I really, truly have to thank everybody for your love and support for all of the wonderful human beings that I've come into contact with, whether through just interviewing them and featuring them in this podcast, but all the other countless human beings that I've spoken with and have shared with me their their ideas and their thoughts and their feelings about all of this, about the time that we're in and uh, what we discuss in these episodes. Uh, it's been a truly wonderful thing, and, and especially to the patrons and to people who have decided, who are capable of and have decided to support me monetarily, whether through a one-time donation or through the Patreon page, you know, monthly giving me just even a little bit of money. It's just been really, really helpful. You know, this this has been my life work, you know, and so for people to, to respond to it positively and to to provide some support in doing this work, it just, it's it's, it's incredible. It's, it's humbling and it's beautiful. So thank you. So the first thing here I'm going to do before we jump into these highlights, uh, these, these various episodes that I want to feature and, and discussions I want to feature here, uh, I want to first play a call by an individual named Peter. He dropped me a line through the uh, the drop file feature that I have now, uh, which you can find instructions down below next to drop me a line. There's a phone number, and there's also this other option where you can, if you're outside the U.S., you can drop me a line through this. It's a little easier to do it that way. So anyway, Peter uh, he has a really great call, some really great information, and it kind of just seemed perfect to fit into this episode. So here it is. Hi Patrick, my name's Peter, I'm 59 years old and I live in the Isle of Man, which is a small offshore island of the British Isles. I like your podcast, you invited people to drop you a line, so I thought I'd do just that. I'm a family physician, or general practitioner to use the British term. I'm not one of the 1% people keep talking about, but I would identify with probably the top 10% in terms of income, and I'm what the British might call upper middle class. I have a conventional lifestyle, I live in a nice house, I go to work in my medical office every day, and I earn a comfortable income seeing patients and sitting in front of a computer printing out prescriptions. 
In other words, I've played the game by the rules and done reasonably well out of the current system. So you might be wondering what on earth I'm doing contributing to a podcast which deals with things like radical political theories and societal collapse. The thing is, I'm not stupid. I realised about 10 years ago that a lot of what we take for granted, like reliable energy, food and water supplies and stable climate, economy and political system, are anything but stable. They're either running out or destabilising rather quickly, and the whole system is most likely heading for some sort of collapse in the not-too-distant future, along with my nice middle-class lifestyle. I don't see any way of avoiding that. The planet is currently supporting probably about five to ten times as many people as it can sustainably support in the long term. Our food supplies are dependent on massive and continuing inputs of fossil fuels, and when those go away, large numbers of people will probably have to go away with them. That's the uncomfortable reality, but none of the people in charge seem to want to do anything about it or even talk about it. So, what am I doing about it? A few things. I've set up a website called Post Peak Medicine, which is mainly aimed at physicians and other healthcare workers who might just be starting to wake up and want some help understanding what's happening and how to practice medicine in the context of a collapsing or collapsed society. It might be of interest to non-medical people too. It contains some free downloadable materials and a blog which I write about once a month when I get time. I'm also studying herbal medicine. I don't practice it, I practice strictly conventional medicine, which means I write prescriptions for medications manufactured by the big pharmaceutical companies. But if and when the complex manufacturing processes and long supply chains break down and prescription pharmaceuticals are no longer available, I think we should have a plan B for producing medicines closer to home. I'm compiling a library of reference books for the time when we need to start making and doing things for ourselves again, covering every possible subject from herbal medicine, which I've already mentioned, to farming, blacksmithing, shoemaking, clothes making, roof thatching, beer making, every possible subject you can think of. The nucleus of my collection is Survivor Library, which you can get from survivorlibrary.com. It's a collection of about 11,000 e-books, which you can buy online. And I've added some of my own favourites, including, of course, a selection of medical books. I'm learning to grow food. I think that access to food and fresh water in the next few decades is going to become more important than access to electricity or even medical care. You can survive for years or decades without electricity or medical care, but only days or weeks without food or water. We take food for granted, but one day people will go to the supermarket and the shelves will be bare. The time to practice growing food is now, while you can still make mistakes and learn from them. It takes about 10 years to become a competent gardener. If you wait until there are food shortages before you start learning to grow food, that's too late and you're most likely going to die. And finally, one thing I'm not doing. I don't talk to anyone about societal collapse or any of the other related subjects that I've mentioned in the last couple of minutes. Not to my family, not to my co-workers, not to my patients, and definitely not to the mainstream media. I might have woken up, but 95% of the population haven't, and there's no point in trying to tell people things they don't want to hear. They'll just get angry or upset. People can find my website if they're looking for it by searching for phrases like post-peak medicine or medicine and societal collapse or medicine and peak oil or things like that. If they're not searching for it, they won't find it, which is absolutely fine by me because I only want people to find it when they're ready. And I like to remain anonymous, which is why my name doesn't appear anywhere on my website. Good luck and thanks for the podcast. Peter, uh, you know, we, we actually correspond a little bit I'll be sure to link people to the websites you mentioned. I am so pleased to hear people like Peter uh, sending me messages. Uh, makes me really, really happy to hear his voice and to know that there are like these, you know, there, there are people that are waking up to this all around the world in very different contexts, and they may not be talking about it. Like Peter said, he doesn't talk about it with his family or friends. It's a really difficult thing. It's a really difficult thing to bear, and people are bearing it. They're doing the best they can anyway. And, uh, you know, most of the time people seek support, but some people just want to do that work kind of in a secret or, or invisible way. 
which I think Peter has done. He's created incredible resources here for us to examine and to look at. And, uh, and like he says, you know, it takes a bit of time to develop these skill sets that are, are going to be more and more needed as, uh, as we proceed into these uncertain times. And uh, so what I really want to do here uh, from now on for the rest of the episode is I'm going to be featuring 20 segments. Sounds like a lot, and actually it is a lot. So this may be a long episode. We'll see how it goes. But I'm going to be featuring 20 segments from the past 100 episodes that I have done. Uh, So obviously I I had to kind of decide which interviews I wanted to feature, which wasn't really that easy, actually. I, I was thinking more of trying to convey certain ideas and concepts that I feel are very, very important at this point in time. So I just sort of picked people based on that. I don't want to feel like anybody is excluded from this, but uh, I hope that uh, the the overall themes and the threads that I'm trying to tie together here make sense to you all. I'm going to try my best to present them, not in a chronological order, but in the order that I felt was most able to explain these things and to express these ideas that I have. Okay, so the first one I'm going to feature is episode 106 of the podcast, with Sylvia Federici. The title of that is Caliban and the Witch, the Body and the Transition to Capitalism. I released this episode well over a year ago at this point. And uh, just to give some background on Sylvia, first of all, I've mentioned her work, her book especially, Caliban and the Witch. I've mentioned that book numerous times in this podcast in different interviews because it's so good and so influential. So it's appropriate that I would maybe begin this with her. You know, Sylvia is a scholar, teacher, activist, and she is the author of numerous books, including Caliban and the Witch, Women, the Body, and Primitive Accumulation. And this segment here is just so that we can get a... I really want to provide a historical context here. I really want to understand the processes, the historical processes, the material conditions that have led us to the moment that we are in. And this includes the ecological crisis. This includes the political crisis. This includes the crisis of the self and of our alienation from our bodies, from the land, which has led to these massive crises that we're now in the midst of right now. I, I find that that often people lack historical context, you know, to understand that this didn't come because w- human beings are naturally brutish and we're naturally warlike and we're naturally going to spoil the entire planet in this sort of progress towards whatever, right? I guess for a while, since having that perspective on things, I I realized, no, actually, there are certain things that we can look at in our history that illuminate the path that we have taken. As you're going to hear here, Sylvia is going to explain what the function of the witch hunts were in Europe during the, say, 15th, 16th, probably even to the 17th, right? Hundreds, we started to see this... uh, this transition to what we'd call capitalism. And during that transition to capitalism, we see the rise of this phenomenon called the witch hunts, in which women, primarily women, and mostly poor women, were targeted as being witches, shrouded in religious language, but women were, I mean, there were literally tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, potentially, of women that were killed, publicly executed, and tortured, And often this event is not really given the attention it really deserves. And Sylvia, being an autonomous Marxist feminist, recognized the value of of digging into this history and how it ties in with other things that were happening simultaneously to this uh, that were feeding into each other. So to understand where this begins, we kind of need to understand that it started with women, and how capitalism emerged from this this subjugation of women and their central role in community. It's like when you look at, at a city or when you look at any landscape, right, that uh, the further up you go, the more you get a comprehensive view. The moment you, you zero in, zero in, and you, all you see is street, but then you know that when you see the street in the context of everything else, you have a much better... And I'm using it for the witch hunt, because it's very, very easy, and, and some prefer that path. It's very easy to get lost into, you know, a particular accusation or a particular set of persecution. But then when you look at it as a whole, then, uh, you know, when you get it, 
um, and as a whole means uh, uh, in both in time, you know, over the period, looking at say the three two centuries and a half in, in which it was particularly massive, and and looking at all the countries that it involved, and when you see what was the period of return, and you put it into world history, and what other things were taking place at the same time, you know, like uh, the conquest of America, like uh, the beginning of the slave trade, like the expropriation of the peasantry, you know, the, in the beginning of a capitalist system, like then, 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 then it begins to 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 speak to you <laughs> in a different way, right? And one of the things that I've been trying to stress over and over is that uh, in in every place across Europe, the Wichan begins with governments uh, passing laws, you know, for example, announcing that uh, there is a new crime, witchcraft, and uh, introducing new regulation, introducing new acts of government. This is very important because uh, it's from above that the people are told, watch out, there are these and these people, and they're doing, uh, it, it's not something that is coming from below, you know. And, uh, you know, the, the, there's also more than, than has gone into Caliban and the Witch. For example, one thing that um, I could have put in, but uh, is that, you know, if if you had, for example, a poor person in the 16th and the 17th century going to a magistrate, you know, to accuse a woman of of being a witch, that poor person would not be necessarily listened to. You know, even who is being listened to? You know, who are the accusers? Whose accusation are are heard? And who are those who are not heard? You know, already tells us the class nature of the witch hunt. Mm-hmm. Because there is immediately one of the second things that is striking is that the difference in class, you know, generally between uh, the so-called witches and the accusers. So you see there is a class difference. You see that those who are accusing them are usually the people of power in their community, people who had property. Uh, so there is, there is, um, you see that it's a persecution, that there's a very clear cut class character. Um, secondly, as of course, an agenda character. And, and uh, there are different groups of women. You know, there are different groups of women who are, who are uh, you know, basically liable, vulnerable to accusation. Uh, it's not one group only. But they are common denominator. Generally, they're poor. They come from the lower classes. And uh, there are certain types of accusations that are very common. And often, they are piled up. A witch is accused of all of them at the same time. So... Um, you know, I, I tried in Caliban and the Witch to give a, a typology of, and uh, the typology of the witch, in my view, is also a typology of the changes the capitalism was trying to introduce, particularly in the sphere of reproduction and in the sphere of relation between women and men. You know, and so the, the witch is the beggar. The old woman, the beggar, was uh, not accepting that the people refuse to to support her, to give her something, you know, when she's... And uh, so there's a whole attack on, co- on communal mutual aid. And uh, there's an attack on, 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 uh, on the idea that, you know, people have a right to, to support themselves, and uh, there is a whole fear on the better off about the poor. You know, poor that have been impoverished, clearly. Because why should there be women who don't have anything, who have to go around the neighborhood 
asking for some wine, some oil, some butter, you know, or living alone in poverty. There's also the women who are, you know, exercising and, you know, healing, healing practices. You know, they basically, they are midwives or, or they are curing people with herbs, with sometimes with, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, charms. Uh, but certainly many women had their own garden. They knew the properties of plants. They knew the properties of roots, flowers, and and they were they were the doctor. So these are women who have a certain power. Often they predicted the future. So there is the figure of the healer, and uh, she represents something in the community. And you know, you have an attack on popular powers. You know, you have an attack on mutual aid. You have an attack on popular powers. There's also the woman who is supposed to be promiscuous, right? And this is very, very, there is a whole campaign on the question of sexuality and procreation. So I'm trying to show that the witch hunt is also a way for the state and capital to begin to exert a new type of control uh, over the body of women control procreation, make sure the procreation is uh, productive, you know, it's, uh, yeah, the, the women use their sexuality in a productive way, you know, to, to give birth, and also sexuality has to be controlled, you know, sexuality is seen as a, something that can subvert social order, it can subvert, uh, you know, people's relation to work, it can subvert the uh, class differences. Um, so the, the body of women begins to be portrayed as something that is dangerous, you know, as a place of dangers that have to be neutralized. So I'm saying that uh, out of the witch hunt comes a, a whole new regime, you know, a whole new disciplinary regime that, you know, it's clearly what becomes the norm um, for women in capitalism. And and I, I said that there is you can see that there is an important difference between the image of the woman that uh, is as described before the witch hunt in the popular literature and the image of the woman that uh, as it appears in the literature of the seventeenth, eighteenth century, you know, after the witch hunt. There is a defeat in between. The, the witch hunt is a, is a defeat on the power of women, is an attack on the social power of women, and it's also a preparation of the woman to, be, to take on particular tasks. You know, she becomes the unpaid worker, she becomes, you know, the one confined to the work of reproduction, and she's the one who is portrayed as not having much reason, being, you know, Weaker in a reasoning power and needing to be controlled by men. And so it's really, I mean, the witch hunt is really a, a, the, the condition, the step towards uh, you know, the creation of the new sexual division of labor. So as you can hear there, uh, Sylvia is just explaining how capitalism emerged out of this phenomenon, this movement, this centuries-long oppression of women and the connection to the ancestors, the connection to the land, the connection to the body, and all the social divisions that emerged out of this uh, informed the rise of the global capitalist system. And that sounds like a really big statement, but it plays a big part in it. And what you're going to hear here with uh, Gerald Horn uh, kind of ties it into the slave trade, to the formation of the Americas, and how America itself is built on these ideas that emerged around the same time that the witch hunts were happening in Europe. The idea here is to connect the idea that European states, European nations that began to colonize the rest of the world were coming from a place where they were doing the same things to women and to the poor in Europe. We were seeing at that time the Enclosure Acts, we started to see governments closing off the commons, uh, turning it into land that had to be used for some purpose other than just 
subsistence and just for the sake of it, right? It became about profit. It became about owning capital and property. And we saw the witch hunts emerge out of this time. And we also see, as Gerald Horn here is going to explain, the slave trade and the foundations of the prosperity that is the Americas, the American continent, the American experiment. Uh, And I'll just say here, uh, Gerald Horn was featured in episode 120. This is America, the Apocalypse of Settler Colonialism. He is a author, historian, and he's very, very prolific. He's released over 30 books. And in that interview, we talk about his book, The Apocalypse of Settler Colonialism, The Roots of Slavery, White Supremacy, and Capitalism in the 17th Century, North America and the Caribbean. And so we just discuss how, you know, the problems we have now in great part come from our understanding or lack of understanding of our own history. It's like the ghosts that linger on this land, the the slaughter, the mass genocide of indigenous populations here in America, the the lingering and, and ever-present impacts that the slave trade had on the uh, African populations, on the people of Africa and the people that were transported here, uh, that were forced to work on plantations for white people and how race, the idea of whiteness, the idea of blackness, the idea that there is this division that these people are different, really came out of the necessity of building a slave economy, which gave rise to a capitalist economy, right? And so we still have the lingering after effects of this. I mean, we're still perpetuating these problems in different ways and different forms and in different contexts, but they come from the same place. You know, I'm doing this project on the 1500s right now, and one of the things that strikes me, particularly with regard to England, was that England was under tremendous pressure from the Spanish, who had first mover's advantage because they had sponsored Columbus's journey. Mm -hmm. And you may recall that it was in 1588 that only a bout of bad weather kept the Spanish Armada, perhaps, from conquering England. And as a result, England tried to carry favor with black people, because as you know, England doesn't move into the Americas until the 1600s, and I'm talking about the 1500s. Mm -hmm. And so they're carrying favor with black people in order to counter Spain. That is to say, in Panama, for example, which had a heavy black population, Sir Francis Drake, the Her Majesty's pirate, uh, carries favor with black people when he arrives in (laughs) Panama in the late 1500s. Also, Morocco. So, uh, England has this trade relationship with Morocco, where it uh, sells Morocco weapons and then gets back saltpeter to make ammunition. And even in my 17th century book, in the early 1600s, there's there's a kind of queasiness, uh, if you may recall, in terms of some of the settlers enslaving Africans. Not necessarily a queasiness about enslaving indigenous populations. But certainly about enslaving Africans, and that begins to change. And as I said in my previous remark, the turning point is 1655. So what I'm trying to grapple with is that age-old question, which is, does slavery help to give rise to racism and white supremacy? Or is there sort of a pre-existing white supremacy that gives rise to slavery? Now, I have to say I'm biased towards the former idea. That is to say that slavery helps to give rise to racism, I'm, although I'm trying to maintain an open mind because mm-hmm. I recognize that as early as the 1440s, you have Portuguese going into West Africa and enslaving Africans and bringing them back to Europe, for example. Mm-hmm. As early as, say, the 14th century, I'm talking about the 1300s, you have certain Iberian nationals going into Africa and trying to set up plantations on African soil, like Sao Tome and Principe, this island off the coast of West Africa. But then again, you know, if you look at the work of the great classicist Frank Snowden, uh, Before Color Prejudice, The Ancient View of Blacks, you know, he tries to bring forward evidence to, to suggest that uh, there is no necessary animus towards darker-skinned people. Miranda Kaufman, in her book Black Tutors, which deals with the 1500s, which is very interesting, uh, you know, she talks about the black population in England in the 1500s, and she even, she cites this interesting case of this black man who beats up this man who you would define as white, who of course is English, 
and uh, there's no necessary uh, recriminations or repercussions. And she brings this forward as evidence to suggest that there's no pre-existing animus towards darker skinned people. So I, I would, I'm grappling with all these ideas and, I, and I'm, uh, as I said, I'm predisposed to think that slavery gives rise to racism and white supremacy, uh, but I'm trying to maintain an open mind. Of course. Yeah, of course. Um, so it, so how did how did slavery ultimately inform the socioeconomic system that we have today? So let's try to extrapolate to the present moment, of course, and see how how our social relations through through the economic system of capitalism has has uh, you know informed our behavior and how we understand our past. Um, do you think that 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 we would have such a developed form of capitalism without slavery, or could we have reached this moment without the enslavement of countless human beings? I would tend to lean towards the latter point of view, that the great wealth that seems to exist in the United States is heavily grounded upon slavery and the African slave trade. I mean, keep in mind that with the African slave trade, you begin to see the enhanced construction of ships not only to transport the Africans across the Atlantic, but also warships to batter West Africa, and also East Africa, I should say, into submission in order to gain these enslaved, and also to beat off rivals, you know, the Dutch, the Danes, the French, the Portuguese, the Spanish. And then there is the question of financing the, these voyages through banks, which gives rise to a banking system. And then, of course, the ships, you need workers to construct these ships. And then they are getting wages uh, in Western Europe, and then they are able to buy other items, and then that leads to spinoff industries there. And then there are insurance companies, which even today uh, control huge amounts of capital, because there was the, always the danger of shipboard insurrections by the Africans, and that had to be insured against. And so you begin to see this takeoff of this system we now know as capitalism in the 17th century precisely because of slavery and the slave trade. Now, I, I should say that, you know, I try to take this argument forward, but it would be a bridge too far to say that I'm the only person who's thought of this idea. Mm -hmm. I mean, what Walter Rodney in his book, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, Eric Williams and Capitalism and Slavery, the University of Rochester historian Joseph Inacori uh, on African Industrial Revolution in England. Uh, many other scholars uh, ha have dealt with this question as well. And, uh, and it's well recognized that, uh, say, 1860, on the verge of the U.S. Civil War, the most valuable property in these United States of America was the property in enslaved Africans. And this leads to, of course, this conflict over slavery that causes this great civil war leading to the deaths of 700 to 800,000 people. And then the fateful decision is made uh, post-1865 that not only will the enslaved population not be granted reparations, but also the slave owners <laughs> won't be compensated because, mm. you know, they were compensated when Britain abolished slavery in the 1830s. And uh, when the slave owners in Dixie were not compensated, obviously that leaves many of them poor with their property, which previously they had come to see as not part of the human family, uh, walking around claiming equality, which helps to engender wrath and fury, uh, leading to the rise of the Ku Klux Klan and racial violence, racist terror. Uh, and perhaps bruised feelings since this country has really not come to grips with that particular decision, not to mention everything else that we've talked about. Mm -hmm. So I guess the long and the short of it is that uh, there needs to be some sort of reckoning at some point in the 21st century with regard to many of these issues that historians like myself are, are raising. All right, and now we're going to move on to a segment uh, with Shane Burley. This is from my most recent interview with Shane Burley. I've interviewed Shane three times for the podcast, including a, a video interview I did with him with uh, Rob Simetz uh, back in January. But this is from our most recent interview in episode 181, The Violent Myth of White Erasure, 
terror in Christchurch. And so I contacted Shane because he is a researcher into far right uh, movements in the United States and internationally as well. He studies anti fascist resistance, workers' rights, and class struggle. And he's also the author of Fascism Today What It Is and How to End It. So he has a really deep understanding of far right organizing, fascism. And so I contacted him after the the attack in Christchurch, New Zealand, in which a a white supremacist went into two mosques, killed uh, 51 people, and he released some kind of manifesto explaining his motives. And of course, it's steeped in this sort of racial identity, uh, you know, the the idea that that, uh, you know, foreigners are coming in and and erasing white identity, white culture, um, you know, what's been called white genocide. So, you know, it's a myth. It's a myth of white erasure. And it's something that's been spread around uh, white supremacist circles, white nationalist circles. There's sort of this this racial theory or or pseudoscientific ideas about race and the differences between so-called races, uh, which still is being passed around to this day, even though they've been largely disputed by serious academics and research. But to this day, they still persist. And uh, Shane has done a great job in previous interviews explaining that. So in this in this interview in particular, we just examine the fragility of white identity, the idea that white people are under threat. I mean, where does that come from? Where does this this fragility, this fear of whiteness being erased come from? And if you think about the past two segments I just featured, which explain the historical processes that have led to capitalism rising as the dominant economic social order in the world, kind of a Eurocentric perspective on things, uh, you look at these countries like New Zealand, which have been colonized by Europeans, in Australia as well, which this this shooter was from, why do we have this sense that as the world begins to experience more and more stress uh, as a result of ecological crisis, uh, environmental degradation, climate change, that we're also experiencing a rise of far-right violence? Why is this the case? Shane kind of goes over this. We discuss this a bit in this segment. We tie it into this broader crisis that's unfolding on this planet. It's a crisis of identity, a crisis of identity that's emerged out of hundreds of years of colonization. The impacts this has had not only on, of course, people of color, those that have been uh, historically marginalized by the system, but also how white people too, while obviously not experiencing that level of oppression, are in and of themselves stunted in that their identity is so shallow. Any anthropologist, anybody who studies history, anybody who looks at how European societies migrated and, and interacted with one another, the kind of intercultural communication that existed between different religions, different belief systems, different ethnic groups, whatever kind of category you want to say that, uh, you know, frame that in. There was a lot of crossing. There was no like provincial little white race, you know, society that existed at any point in human history. And yet we tend to project these ideas onto the past. And that, that to me is what's so kind of, um, a disturbing aspect of it. Uh, not, not, of course there's, there's a lot of disturbing aspects of it, but that to me seems like a really disturbing quality of it, which is this, this kind of almost, I don't know if it's robust or not, but it's a real thick, ideology that sort of bleeds out of this you know what i mean like white people have always been great why doesn't anyone see that and we have to protect that i have to do whatever i can at any cost to protect the white race from being infiltrated by these aliens by these other people and it just has always been to me really a ridiculous because concept and it's in and that's where the whole identity thing comes in that really bothers me is like um it's so based on a, a fragile thing. It, it, to me, the white identity is, it feels so fragile. And anytime it feels threatened, all these acts of violence emerge out of it. And it just, it's, it's disturbing to me. Uh, I don't know. It's just kind of a rant, but I don't know if there's a question in there for you. <laughs> but it's just, it, it, it gets me going because I think about just the very premise of what it's built on is so faulty, you know? Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I think, I think something here is that a real internalization of a settler colonialist myth about what whiteness is and about what whiteness has meant. So this idea that white people are disappearing, uh, it takes a very, very narrow view of itself. So for example, the, the idea that 
that white people are disappearing is really an issue of skin color, like the actual pigmentation of it. There's going to be fewer people with a certain level of lightness in their skin. Now, we all know skin comes at a gradient. I don't know what point it becomes white um, or at what point it stops being white. But the point here is that when they say the decline of white people, it really is about a number of people with a very, very specific phenotype. But the problem with that is that the genes themselves that go into whatever they think the construct of these people is don't disappear. They progress. They build new communities. They go on. Names change. Peoples change. That's just the story of human beings. And so this notion that something that is totally artificial, that even when you get down to the core of it, has to be a socially constructed tribal identity is latched onto with such vigor as if it's a scientific fact and the reality of it uh, determines whether or not we have successful lives and we'll have futures. It's a really bizarre notion. And to, to the, the fact that we continue to prop up a history that, that Europe's history was, you know, um, monoracial, that, um, that the Europeans had some legitimacy to land and things like that. As long as we continue to make that the central narrative, we're going to continue to allow an identity that's wholly toxic to foster and build up. And there's really nothing positive about this core white identity that exists. Um, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just, yeah. I, I, well, I guess maybe in my meandering rant that there before was, I guess what I was trying to get at was that white anxiety that we see in, white communities in general, if you want to call them white communities or predominantly white um, settlements or, or neighborhoods or cities or whatever it is, right? This sense that they're being invaded and that this is a response to like capitalism. But my, my I guess my thing was, is that you mentioned this in your piece with, with, uh, you know, with Alexander Reed Ross, which is the, yes, th what happened in New Zealand and what happens seemingly now all over the world with these white supremacists um, committing acts of terror is that that's an extreme, as a, an extreme expression of a sentiment that is actually felt in pretty non extreme environments, if that makes sense. Like white people, and I'm, I, I know I, this, this is a huge generalization, white people, right? That's kind of a part of the problem to some degree, but this general white identity that maybe white people feel, whether they consciously analyze it or not, um, it's prevalent all over the, at least I could speak as an American, it seems like I see it all over the United States. Um, uh, I think the sense that, and it, it definitely is present within, I think, many of the the fans of Donald Trump, um, especially. Um, but this sort of white, anxi white anxiety, yeah, it just seems like it gives a almost a center to allow for these types of actions to emerge in the first place, if that makes any sense at all. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I think in a way that identity is what is grappled with because it's what they have. Um, so you mentioned being at a, a point of late capitalism, and I think it's really important to kind of think about what that means. We're talking about climate collapse, just total collapse. We're talking about an economic system that is literally breaking apart at the seams. Um, even while people live reasonably comfortable lives in a lot of like global northern first world countries, there is an incredible anxiety that grows in people, both from the discontent from their lives. You know, people work shitty jobs, have shitty relationships, um, uh, don't have strong communities, all those sorts of things. And at the same time, don't have any guarantees about who they're going to be in the future. Um, whiteness is there. Uh, whiteness is a language they're fluent in. Um, and it's it's really hard to then present a revolutionary alternative and say, you know, that whiteness also is actually holding you back. It's also um, actually a toxic falsehood. Um, and so I think as we're seeing a shift in politics away from what, what has sometimes been called soft power, the power of negotiation, of values, influencing decisions, of negotiation, things like that, to a place of, of really hard power in a lot of ways where people – um, parties, political parties, political actors, and so on, kind of battle for hegemony in a certain way. We're seeing the rise of a far right, um, sometimes fully white nationalism, sometimes more of like an undercurrent of nativism, like you were mentioning. Um, that's here to stay because it's feeding on a general change in society away from a perceived stability. Um, and that anxiety only grows. Um, I think that that 
people who have a, a, a left alternative to that or a revolutionary alternative to that have a lot to offer in that realm. But the contention with white supremacy is massive. And it's not as though I think there's an easy solution to confront those sorts of things either. Shane has such a great way of talking about these subjects, and, and that's why I've enjoyed speaking with him so many times. He's just so good at explaining this crisis, explaining how as the climate falls apart, as our economy increasingly fails to serve the needs of, of everyday people, uh, they cling to these identities. They cling to things like racial identities, right? And that's why white people can and do feel threatened by what's currently unfolding. And they attribute it to race. They attribute it to the other. And so I, I was trying to figure out the best way to then segue into this other segment here. Um, and I think talking about identity and talking about the real trauma ways in which this level of othering, of dehumanizing, the kind of language that is used to dehumanize whole groups of human beings, and how social crisis, when that emerges, how this can erupt in some truly horrific violence, uh, where whole populations are targeted by the dominant culture, by the dominant uh, members of the society. So uh, last year, I had the really great fortune to work with uh, an individual named Cynthia Jones, who is the artistic director of Inspirata Dance Project. It's a local dance project here in uh, Twin Falls, Idaho, where I currently live. Uh, last year, we decided to collaborate on an upcoming uh, dance production, which I actually just saw a few weeks ago. The idea was to feature refugees in the community, the voices of refugees, and to use their stories, if, if they chose, of course, to share that with us, uh, to share their stories in, in that dance production. And I released them on my end as episodes. So I had three episodes I did in total. The first was with Samra Kolum, the second was with Melissa Popovich, and the third was with Leah Babayan. And I've interviewed Leah in particular two times. This was our second interview. Leah was featured in episode 131, the other genocide life after segments of these interviews the audio of these interviews was featured in the dance production and it was an incredibly powerful thing to see and it was really interesting to see how this work served an artistic production that dealt with incredibly difficult concepts and ideas and so i really have to thank leah uh, for sharing this part of her life with us for to grow her to grow up as a young armenian girl uh, with her family in the capital of Azerbaijan, Baku, and how there was a pogrom enacted against the Armenians. And people, the, the political power at the time was, was uh, giving the go-ahead for people to attack Armenians in their homes. And, I mean, it was just, it was genocide. It was, it was absolute genocide, horrific violence, hard to really comprehend and so this is just a segment of our discussion in which she talks about what it feels like to be dehumanized on this level. This is just so we can get a fuller picture of what has manifested under this paradigm that we're in, this paradigm of mass societies, mass cultures, and how whole groups of human beings can be dehumanized and othered. And this is exactly what we need to avoid. And by listening to refugees' stories, these human beings, these incredible women that I had the fortune of getting to know a little bit and, uh, and had the opportunity to share their stories through this podcast, it, it just exposed me, it opened me up to really what exists on the other side if we don't, uh, if we don't build something better. And so Leah is a local entrepreneur. She's an activist. She is, as I mentioned, a refugee. And she's also the owner of the consignment boutique here in Twin Falls, Idaho, Ooh La La. Uh, and she's also the author of a memoir, Liminal, which goes over a lot of the stuff that she discusses in this interview, except in more depth, of course. So here is a segment of our discussion. When you're hunted as a human being, when you feel hunted like an animal, some of the emotion you have um, isn't human-like. Hmm. You know, you, you go back to this most primitive, primitive feeling. It's not human. I'm not talking about like the fear of the dark and the fear of a boogeyman and the fear of like losing your, your family. You know, those are, those are pretty common, maybe fears. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're hunted, 
when you feel being hunted for whatever reason it doesn't even matter if it's religious or ethnic or whatever it all comes down to that same primitive animal low 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 frequency like and the emotions there they're not human they're not a, they're not supposed to be part of the human experience that's why we are well, that's probably civilized. the base 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 level and then human and whatever humans are they have do the evolutionary process has built our levels on top that's why we have the you know the, the prefrontal cortex that's like where you as a human really that's your personality that's mm -hmm. where rationality that's where it all comes in and then you have the mammalian brain and then you get down to the reptilian brain and mm -hmm. i don't know how accurate those terms actually are for describing what you're saying but my yeah. sense is that the brain is a it's like a it's building and certain things get de-emphasized as other processes yeah. come into play so when you're in a situation like you just described you're actually being hunted those emotions are ancient because mm -hmm. that's probably what it felt like to be a pre-hominid, pre-pre-pre-human thing. And, and we just were somehow emerged out of that as a species. And there's no room for those emotions in a civilized setting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why a lot of people will, will go silent or go within and internalize their trauma and um, their experience is there's not a language for it and half and, and most of it even is so unbelievable that it is difficult to express so yeah that base that base low so you know we pride ourselves as a society we get to this point where like our little children are supposed to feel this way mm -hmm. and anything below that is a taint on their childhood and um, worthy of um, coddling, mm -hmm. worthy of like treatment and n n nursing and and um, healing. You know, there's a standard. Yeah, and and every society is different. Like you go to some societies and that standards way down here like six year olds are working and hunting and <laughs> providing they don't get therapy for that yeah but um when society collapses and when there's war and when there's uh where we're barbaric and there's ethnic killing that whole standard of of the emotional development especially for children children of war and children of of these conflicts that just goes away mm -hmm. there's no low mm. and so the experience it it drops with that you know that the the most the most lowest existence for humanity is when society dissolves mm -hmm. and order and safety and that happens to you know a lot of people who are escaping atrocities and like i said if they're being hunted if they're feeling that um threat on their life and it's a it's a pure threat from another human being on your life it's not because you committed a crime um it's not because of something you've done. So there's no, there's not at all any kind of a rules to go by in, in that. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's, um, there's very, um, I think very strong feelings that are very difficult to express when someone goes through um, feeling of being disposable, you know? Yeah. Like, that feeling, feeling of your humanity disappearing and becoming subhuman and disposable 
those don't just go away when you're safe. Yeah. They don't just like, you don't just land here and the Statue of Liberty waves at you and you all of a sudden are upgraded with like human 2.0 or whatever. The Like all of your uh, experiences disappear. Yeah. Yeah, no. You don't. Feeling subhuman stays with you. That is your trauma. You know, being re- being regarded as disposable, like the lowest of the lowest when it comes to human life, even more disposable than material objects. Like there's art that's more valued than human life. Mm. Yeah. There's like Jesus cheese. There's like that cheese that has the <laughs> Jesus's face on it or something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And no disrespect to Jesus. Like Jesus Jesus is my is my friend, you know. But <laughs> no, I, what I'm saying is there's there's pieces of cheese that's valued more than human life. Yeah. That you know, people will go like in the streets and like save that cheese, you know. People will protect the cheese yeah. over life. Yeah. Yeah. So when you in your psyche when you Come to grips, you know, and, and imagine this, like, I'm a kid. I'm a kid that just is the most, you know, naive, like, I'm just like feeling things like, oh, that does that when I touch it. And right. that dandelion's magic, mm-hmm. you know, like, when you're a kid, you don't think dandelions are weeds, they're magic, they're like wands. And and your wishes are supposed to come true, you know, when you when you blow on those dandelions. But you're a kid and you're just in this, you're sensing the world and you're piecing together what you can even remember day to day because you go to sleep and you wake up like you only stored a tiny bit of your experience because you're a kid. And you're eating and you're playing and you're, you're not thinking about it. You're just in the process of just being there and being a kid. And then all of a sudden you're shown, you're not told, but you're shown that you're not worthy of, of life or you're not, your humanity is negotiable mm. or you're, maybe you don't understand your own humanity, but you can see that these adult people in your life, they're shook. And these people are like pillars to you. They're they're unshakable, you know. Your grandparents and your parents, if they look at you a certain way, they're gods when you're a kid. And when you see the adults shook and when you see that they're like becoming smaller and dimmer and fearful and hiding and minimizing themselves, minimizing their humanity, their their wholeness then you just learn naturally that, oh, okay, we're, we're, we're those people. We're disposable. We're the, we're the disposables. No one has to tell you. And then you see that because you become homeless and nobody cares. And your family members are slaughtered and that's normal. That's like normalized. And so Leah here just gave us a, a glimpse into what it's like to be on the other end of this, to be the one that's targeted, to be the one that is othered, to be the one that is stripped of everything and has to constantly bear this trauma, this very difficult memory or, or, or memories. I mean, it, that never leaves you. And, and if we're going to build something beautiful in this time, we have to do everything we can to counter fascism, to counter authoritarianism, to counter these dehumanizing narratives. We have to come up with better narratives. We have to come up with ways of living and being in this world that encourages solidarity and understanding between people. It's easier said than done. I'm not necessarily one that knows even how to do this, but there are plenty of people who do. And so I want to tie this in, and I don't even know how I'm going to do this. <laughs> this segue here is a little tricky, too. I'm going to try to tie this into uh, uh, Stephen Jenkinson. Uh, Stephen Jenkinson is somebody I, I had interviewed previously, uh, once before this interview, and unfortunately at that time, 
I had a glitch with my computer at the time. I had this really shitty old laptop that stopped working uh, the way it was supposed to, and uh, I lost my first discussion with Stephen. But luckily, several months later, I was able to get into contact with him again and uh, set up a second interview. This one, of course, has been recorded and released. Uh, It was episode 134, the title of which is Elderhood, Coming of Age in Troubled Times. And, uh, you know, Stephen Jenkinson, he's the founder and lead instructor of the Orphan Wisdom School and the author of numerous books, including Die Wise, A Manifesto for Sanity and Soul, and most recently, Come of Age, The Case for Elderhood in a Time of Trouble. So we are in this time of trouble. We are in a time of crisis. We are in a time where traditionally we would have elders. We would have individuals in our society that really, has, as Stephen explains, it's not really about age, although it does help. Having life experience helps. But elders are not people that just automatically become elders who enter into elderhood because of their age. It doesn't matter. It's more about fulfilling that role. And it's something of a thankless role. It's it's not something you do to receive credit and admiration and all of that from others. You do it because it needs to be filled. And every healthy, robust culture has a function for elders in it. It's necessary. And unfortunately, as a result of the historical processes up to the present moment, we have, over the past several generations, lost elderhood in a sense even at a time we need it most elders are hard to find and why is that why is it hard to find elders in this time to help us to help us understand and navigate through these difficult times these times of trouble so stephen explains this a bit in this segment and explains what elders are and i just have to say stephen is one of the he's a difficult person to interview because he he always surprises you. You never know what he's going to say or how he's going to explain things. And he's an incredibly articulate and profound human being. And his perspective is very, very unique. Uh, he worked for years in palliative care in a major hospital in Toronto. He's guided dozens or I should, I should say hundreds of people through the death process. And he, in that process, has come to understand our culture for what it really is, the dominant culture of North America, as he frames it. So uh, in our times of trouble... Where are the elders? So, of course, you're, you're, you're making the case for why we need elderhood in this time of trouble. And yeah. if we don't have elders to look towards, if we don't have anything to, like you mentioned, the, the Italian woman, you know, food makes you hungry. Without food, you wouldn't feel the hunger for it. Right. If I don't have an elder to look towards, if we as a culture, as a people, are bereft of elderhood, yeah, and people are again asking to be recognized as elders without actually being elders. Right. Well, I, I'm not. I think it's again a, na- a naive thing to ask for a solution because that isn't what you're going to provide, and you're not here to provide a solution. But how do you sense this is going to play out? I mean, I, I, I on this podcast in particular, um, I discuss a lot of environmental issues. I discuss what's happening with our climate system with the uh, ecological systems of our planet and how we are in a time of massive, unprecedented, catastrophic change. And and elderhood, if anything, would represent the time and the place that we are in right now. And so what is the elderhood? Of, sorry. Sorry, the plight of elderhood. The plight of is, elderhood. Is, is one of the human echoes of the ecological dilemma you just articulate. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so what would elderhood look like, feel like, be like in mm-hmm. this time that we are in. Very good. Very good. You see, that's a that's a very achieved question now. Rather than to ask about elderhood in some kind of abstract universal constant, your question actually tips towards the answer. That means your question includes the acknowledgement that the, there are something particular about this time that might have consequence for elderhood that is not entirely catastrophic. Exactly. So, you know, you credited me with having no answers. And (laughs) let me, let me see if I can be, you know, make you uh, doubt that ever so slightly. (laughs) So, so here we go. Now, if elderhood is an identity and swept up with all the other identity clamor 
of our time, then what you'd go about doing is looking for people with that, quote, personality type or that kind of wrinkle. Or maybe there's an elderhood MMPI. You familiar with the phrase? Uh, no, I'm not. A, a psychological testing apparatus whereby we can tease out, you know, elder tending personality types, things like this. And then you can identify the particular um, kind of elder you're looking for and dial that in, etc. And before you know it, instead of speed dating, you got speed eldering maybe on the Internet. And you just, you know, you just <laughs> tell them what you're interested in as far as being mentored. And lo and behold, you know, 10 older people pop up and you get to choose. I mean, I wouldn't be the least surprised that that would come. Mm. And somebody's going to work on it as soon as they've heard me suggest it, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. So n another sign of the end times, you see? Yes. But, but I'm going to offer you an alternative to that. And I'm going to suggest to you that elderhood is not a figment of personality. It's not an aspect of identity. It has nothing to do with the particular qualities of individuals. Yikes. Well, where else does it live? And the answer is elderhood is first, foremost, and will always be a cultural function. And in that understanding, an elder is a culture worker. And as such, not inherently, inevitably, or, or mandatorily, an old person. Having said that, I'll acknowledge something, that it would appear to me to be a truism that while um, all elders tend to be older, not all older people are elders. Okay, so there's something that works in that arrangement. So if elderhood is not a personality type, what else could it be? You've said it's something to do with culture, but, but what precisely? Well, the answer is the subtitle of my book is, it's why I called it The Case for Elderhood in a Time of Trouble. I'm saying that I believe that the, that the particular wrinkles of elderhood are dictated by the times in which the possible elders find themselves. They were born to a particular time, and the particulars of those times dictate what elderhood must be now, you see. So this means elders themselves must be on the steep learning curve, and they must be deep running students of, the, of their times, and their responsiveness to their times is what qualifies them. So the word responsibility really works here. You know, it's not a sense of burden the way people usually use the word. The, the sense of responsibility means simply the capacity to respond, maybe to distinguish that from react. Maybe react, we could use that word to describe certain responses you have that attempt to satisfy you or assuage you or reassure you, whereas the capacity to respond might have nothing to do with you trying to feel better about anything. It might have to do with your sense of a kind of moral, political, cultural, spiritual obligation to, to fully inhabit the conditions of citizenship, if you will. But your citizenry is not to a particular geopolitical identity. Your deep citizenship is, um, is a devotional one, not an affiliation one. And in, in that sense, you know, the work that you join yourself to is dictated by your time's troubles. And that's what you're a citizen of. You're a citizen of a troubled time, not Canada or the United States, you know, or any other, um, you know, freewheeling entity today. So if that's possible, if that's possible, then it means that elders are not in the business of getting themselves recognized. They're in the business of recognizing so you could say in a time when elderhood's gone into terrible abeyance, which is certainly our time now, then it becomes the, the eldering responsibility of elders to function at the level of recognizing incipient elderhood in their midst and proceeding accordingly by acknowledging it, recognizing it, corroborating it, um, living as if it's true, um, authorizing it without ever trying to be included in it or to benefit directly from it. You follow what I'm saying? Okay, it's a, it's a radical re-understanding of what it means to be an elder. And it's not a club. 
you get to join. It's the ending of all clubs in a time like ours. That no elder in a time like this, if I may sound programmatic about it, no elder in a time like this would ever call themselves an elder. Ever. Okay. Why not? Because this is the responsibility of the people around them to recognize elderhood in their midst, to corroborate it and everything I just said. And if it doesn't happen, it's because there's no elders to do so. And because the appetite for elderhood has gone missing in the way we talked earlier about if kids are young people are not exposed to it, then their appetite for it begins to atrophy. And they, they trade it in for self-reliance or for a kind of principled anxiety that masquerades as having a conscience. But it's more at the level of just a chronic free-floating anxiety where you care about everything, but only enough to paralyze you or to animate you with extraordinary levels of kind of sulfuric anger and incandescent rage that doesn't know how to proceed, this kind of thing, <clears throat> which is a kind of narcissism, frankly. So <clears throat> this is an awful lot to say <clears throat> in response to a <clears throat> short question, but if you know, at the risk of sounding like I'm giving a, a formula of how to pull this off, I would simply say in a time like ours now, it might be the fundamental responsibility of people who may yet come to inhabit the elder function that they must do so minus acknowledgement, minus recognition. And the way they do it is by corroborating the, the presence of elders around them. So a very quick way of saying it, and this gives away basically, you hear this, you don't need to buy the book, and I guess that, but it, it would come down to this. The greater elderhood skill now is the skill of having, of knowing how to have elders in your midst. It is not the skill of knowing how to be one. As you listen to Stephen Jenkinson explain what we lack or what is required of us to make up for what we lack in this so-called culture that we have in the dominant culture of North America, I hope it's understood that by framing everything as I have up to this point, that there are good reasons, not right reasons, but good reasons as to why we are at this point, that we are lacking in more ways than one, that we have been born into these historical circumstances, and without having a proper framework to understand why we are the way we are and how we got to this point, we can't really understand what is currently unfolding. And as I mentioned at the beginning of that segment with Stephen, and as he mentions there at the beginning as well, this lack of elderhood, this lack of a, of a vital cultural function is mirroring or is reflective of the ecological crisis, the deeper disconnections that we are often unaware of, uh, seeing how this system is producing one of the greatest crises that we have ever known as a species. A pivotal moment in this, I guess, in this journey that I've taken was uh, last year, I did a TEDx talk. It was the first time I ever did a public talk. And in, in a way, I, I, I guess I, I treated it a bit like I was coming out. I was really saying it out loud on a stage, telling people, we are in the midst of a mass extinction event. Uh, we are ignoring the severe changes that are happening in our global climate system that is very likely leading to our extinction as a species and the inevitable extinction of countless other species, because it's not just about us, is it? It's that disconnection from everything else, all other life on this planet, thinking ourselves different and how the system produces these problems. That That's the big thing here, right? I mean, elderhood, lack of elderhood, as Federici discussed there with the uh, the rise of capitalism, the transition to capitalism, and all that was required, all the violence that had to be enacted by powerful patriarchal organizations in order to to bring about this new world order, uh, you know, it has led to its logical conclusion, which is a complete detachment, well, not complete, but a seemingly complete detachment of the human race, of the human species from the natural world, thinking ourselves clever and ingenious enough to avoid all of these crises that we've generated. 
I was nudged in the right direction in order to do this TEDx talk, which was at the Orpheum Theater here in Twin Falls, Idaho. Again, I uh, the title of that talk was Forging Connections in Perilous Times. It was recorded uh, April last year. A topic that I discuss quite regularly and frequently on this podcast uh, can be called environmental issues. I think that is um, a rather neutered term. I like to more accurately describe it as the systematic unraveling of our biosphere or the life systems of our planet. <laughs> I think it's um, not quite as benign as environmental issues, but I do think it is much more accurate as a descriptor. As it stands today, our culture is a life-destroying force on this planet. Since 1970, global wildlife populations have declined by over 50%. Insect populations worldwide have seen massive declines these past several decades as well. Our oceans are in dire straits. With the excessive amounts of carbon that have been produced by human industrial activity, creating an effect in our oceans where it's becoming more acidic and essentially inhospitable for life to exist. And that doesn't even include all of the billions of tons of plastics and toxic waste that we've been dumping into our oceans. In the global north, the permafrost, which is of course uh, the frozen soil, or I should say once frozen soil, is thawing. As it thaws, it is releasing massive quantities of carbon and methane into our atmosphere, further exacerbating global climate change, which is, again, a result of human industrial activity these past few centuries. So here I'm just going to segue into my second interview, actually, that I did with Dar Jamal. Just give you a little background on, on who Dar Jamal is. He is an award-winning journalist who regularly reports on climate disruption and environmental issues for the online publication Truthout. And he's also the author of The End of Ice, Bearing Witness and Finding Meaning in the Path of Climate Disruption. I'm actually going to feature another segment here in a little bit featuring a video interview that I did with my friend Rob Simetz and Dar Jamal. For now, I'm just going to segue here into my live interview. So this past October, I did a live podcast where I had uh, people could come and and see it live uh, in person. And I also did a live stream. Uh, I had some really great friends, my friend Jordan Thornquest and uh, Chase Chandler helped film it and put on the whole presentation, record everything. It was a, it went off without a hitch. And I really have to say it was really largely just because of them. But I asked Dar to participate in this so he could help explain through his research, explain abrupt climate disruption, what is currently unfolding in our global climate system right now. You know, there in that TEDx talk, I briefly explained a few of the major trends, but it's really hard within a nine minute talk to really pack all that in there and get to the major point that I was trying to get to. So uh, here in my live podcast with Dar Jamal, uh, he explains currently what is happening in the global climate system. Well, we, we are on track. The most recent graphs that we have, including data from this year show the, the current projection is that uh, we're set up to start having ice-free periods in the summer of Arctic sea ice uh, within about five years from right now. Um, and, and it could be sooner, but the current projections looking at trends and, and minimum extents and minimum volumes, et cetera, show it to be happening, beginning to happen within five years from right now. Um, what, why so many people are fixated on Arctic sea ice, myself included, is because <clears throat> there's there's several very, very worrisome things that are set to happen once that's gone. And we're already actually seeing them start to happen, but that they, they will only accelerate when there's periods of no Arctic sea ice in the summer. The first and most important, I feel, is that that sea ice is basically reflecting back sunlight and the heat with it uh, from going down into the water and getting into the shallow seas and warming them up to a point where the um, massive amounts of methane hydrates that are frozen into that subsea permafrost. Once that starts melting and those get released, methane is a hundred times more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide on a 10 year time scale. And it's still 20 times as potent on a hundred year time scale. 
And once that methane starts getting released on moss, then we're essentially replicating the key extinction driver during the Permian mass extinction 252 million years ago, which wiped out 90% of all life on Earth, most of it in the oceans. And we are, as I said, on track to replicating that. Even this summer, uh, we've seen lakes now in the Arctic that are literally bubbling because permafrost underneath them is melting and releasing methane that's coming up through the water. Other areas in subsea, we're already seeing releases. This has actually been happening for several years now, but it's now accelerating. So for this to happen across the Arctic, and especially once we have that sea ice completely gone for periods during the summer, then we're at grave risk of that happening all across the shallow seas of the Arctic. So that's number one. Number two, it shifts weather patterns globally, and it's also causing uh, things like, you know, as Greenland melts, and as that steady trend of overall melting in Greenland is, is continuing, of course, it vacillates year to year, but overall we see a consistent downward trend as far as, well, as far as increasing melting uh, with Greenland. And then that's causing a disruption of the Atlantic Mariel Dianal Ocean Circulation Current, the AMOC, which is a giant circulating current uh, from the Atlantic. And as that slows down, that is going to affect weather patterns dramatically, particularly in um, northwestern Europe and, and northern Europe. Uh, so, so there's going to be major weather pattern shifts. And along with that comes um, rainfall patterns shifting across the globe. So food, food supplies are going to be impacted, et cetera. And, and that's still a very cursory glance, but that gives you an idea of how important it is that the sea ice uh, remain intact and the unfor uh, unfortunate reality that we're looking at is that it is on its way out. And the things that I described are uh, appearing to be inevitable. Um, it, it's just, I think it's just a question of when. Everything that Dar there uh, has said is coming to pass. I recorded that interview with him. That live podcast was in October of last year. So October, 2018. And as we speak, we are seeing record ice melt in the Greenland ice sheet. Uh, if you look at any graphs that, I mean, I'm recording this uh, June 15th, but if you look at any graphs that have come out in the past few days from this date, you'll see just a huge spike of ice loss and, and temperature rise and all that happening in the Arctic region. It's incredibly disturbing to see what's currently unfolding on this planet right now and how rapidly it is shifting and changing and all these massive disruptions that are coming from it. Uh, even though I'm not going to feature a segment of this, but it reminds me of a previous interview I did with Nicholas Humphrey, meteorologist Nicholas Humphrey. He's an interdisciplinary scientist who really deeply understands uh, climate change. I had an interview with him and we were talking about the floods in the Midwest this past year uh, that we've had this past uh, several months and, and how bad it's been and how if we have as few consecutive years of of these massive floods, these really disruptive weather patterns here in the continental U.S. will we'll have a very deep impact on food production. I mean, already this year, there's there's the flooding was so bad in the Midwest that they're unable to, to plant their crops in the time required. This is going to lead to food price spikes and, and just, it, it's just bad. This is bad. And this is only going to get worse as time goes on. So we need to have uh, the ability to have these discussions with people to be able to learn how to navigate through the very difficult conversations that come up when we have real frank discussions on the state of the world today, the ecological crisis, abrupt climate disruption that is currently manifesting as we speak, and, and it's not going to go away. It's only going to get worse. As this is happening, you know, one thing I notice in doing these public talks and trying to speak to people more directly about these things is that many people don't want to talk about it. They might acknowledge the validity of the science, or they might not, but people don't really want to talk about it. And, and I get it. It's really, really hard. You can't think about it all the time, but we have to. We have to look at this thing in the face. But I, I was always really kind of curious as to why it is so difficult to look at this information, why we have known about this for generations, and yet th the course hasn't been changed, and we haven't tried to to address these issues when we could have done that. 
uh, when we actually could have changed course, we were just not interested in it. So why is that the case? So I came across the work of William Rees, human ecologist, ecological economist. He's Professor Emeritus and former director of the University of British Columbia's School of Community and Regional Planning in Vancouver, Canada. That's a hell of a name. Uh, and he's the originator and co-developer of the ecological footprint analysis. He's able to, in a very data-driven form, analyze literally the ecological footprint of our lifestyle, our way of living. So here in, say, the United States or in Canada, uh, where we live really excessive lifestyles, we can actually, through this this analysis that he helped co-develop, uh, we can actually materially understand how many resources are required and how it's a totally unsustainable, and it's leading to all kinds of environmental, ecological limits on this planet right now. And that, too, is, along with abrupt climate change, is leading potentially to not only the collapse of this civilization, but potentially our extinction. Now, William may not subscribe to that last part, but he certainly understands that it's possible, I think. And and so, you know, in understanding the ecological footprint, um, I asked him in my interview with him, which is episode 125, Marching Towards Collapse, Biophysical Limits, and Our Cognitive Blind Spots, we discussed those cognitive blind spots. You know, why is it that human beings have a hard time accepting this information, understanding it, and making collective or even individual changes to avoid this catastrophe? Human societies have collapsed before. So why are we incapable of learning and being able to understand what changes are required in order for us to avoid these catastrophic uh, shifts? So uh, in this segment, uh, William explains his research into that, and uh, it's pretty astounding stuff. I'll just give you two examples of what's going on here. Uh, and I have to really underscore, we could carry this on for hours because there are many, many other examples. Mm -hmm. Human beings are a product of evolution. We're, we are a species just like all the others, whether we want to acknowledge that or not. And one of the things that that has given us is a, an instinctive response that economists have actually formalized in the concept of discounting. Um, there was tremendous survival value in a kind of short-sighted selfishness. So if you can imagine a band of hunter-gatherers who are a little bit hungry and they, they let's say they find a tree with just a few more apples than they can eat right now. I'm using a trivial example, mm -hmm. but it's easy to understand. Mm -hmm. um, so they feed and there's a few left, which they could leave and wander off and uh, they've been personally sated. But if they did that, they would not benefit from those remaining fruit. Uh, you could call them buffalo, whatever, you get my point. Mm -hmm. And if they move on, maybe somebody else is going to get those fruit. So there's an advantage to them in taking it with them or over-consuming, having a big feed right now and getting fat and lazy and uh, making damn sure that nobody else acquires those assets. So what we tend to do is discount the future. We tend to prefer the here and now over future and uh, distant places. It's a natural tendency that had huge survival, survival value in the past. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what we do when confronted with a decision that would say sacrifice pleasures we are enjoying today, such as enjoying my automobile or my fast uh, or my big house or whatever it might be, if I sacrifice that in order to enjoy a possible benefit in the future, and it's only possible because, you know, people say the science is uncertain. We really don't know what's going to intervene and maybe I'll be dead before the future arrives and all of that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Why would I do that? Why would I give up something now to gain something maybe in the future, some unspecified future benefit mm -hmm. uh, such as climate stability? Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. We have a natural tendency to prefer the here and now over future events. And economy, economists call this discounting, so that we tend to uh, underestimate the impact of future costs, or for that matter, benefits, on our lifestyles today. Another thing is uh, called the public good problem. Supposing I understand profoundly that my lifestyle is having a three or four fold larger impact on the planet than is, first of all, fair and equitable, and 
that much larger than the Earth could actually sustain, even if everybody had a much smaller footprint. And suppose I therefore adapted my lifestyle uh, so that I was conforming exactly to what the Earth could, could handle. Mm-hmm. So I'd have to reduce, say, from six hectares down to one and a half hectares. So that's a that's about an so what seventy five percent or more drop in the total amount of consumption that I can enjoy in my time on Earth. Now, what I've done in doing that is made a huge personal. Well, most of us would see it as a huge personal sacrifice because we couldn't have our gasoline powered cars. We couldn't use. Uh, coal or natural gas to heat our homes and generate our electricity and so on and so forth. So we'd be making an enormous sacrifice in order to improve the global environment. So in a sense, I'd be creating what economists would call, again, a public good. Mm -hmm. But by creating that public good, I pay the entire cost. And my share of the benefits, assuming nothing else happens, my share of the benefit would be immeasurable, unmeasurable. And because my benefit of my cutting back is so infinitesimally small compared to the planet that nobody would even notice. So I make a huge personal sacrifice for an extremely tiny share of any benefit. And by the way, the benefit doesn't get realized anyway, because as soon as I vacate that space, somebody else takes it up. You see what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. All of has created the space for three or four more people in the developed world or, or another person, my neighbor, to get a bigger car and a bigger house and all the rest of it. So there's very little kind of psychological incentive for individuals to act now because, A, they won't gain much anyway, even if nobody else did anything. And there's always this sense that other people are still pushing and consuming and wanting more and, and growing mm-hmm. and having children and, you know, the population is still increasing. So why should I give up anything? in order to uh, right. gain nothing. And that's, that's, I think, a very powerful argument that people use. So in many respects, we're caught both between our instincts to use now and consume as much as we can in the short time that we're on the planet, and this uh, sense that if we didn't do it, we, we, you know, somebody else will anyway. So those are just some of the reasons that are, that are flying in our face. Right. This other problem here. We are a species, this is a difficult one for many people to understand because they think they're living in reality, but we don't actually communicate with reality. Human beings, every culture, socially constructs its perceptions of reality, and then we act out of that reality as if it were true. Mm. So, uh, you know, if you went back, say, 700 years, and I said, hey, the world is flat, nobody's going to dispute Of course, it's flat. Everybody can see that. Mm -hmm. And so we have a common perception of reality that the world is flat. It's completely wrong, but we all agree that the world is flat. And by the way, you could live your life back then as if the world were flat and it wouldn't make any difference. So you're dead wrong and it doesn't make any difference. The sun rises in the east. Well, we all agree with that. But in fact, of course, the sun doesn't rise in the east. It's a social construct that explains things Uh, the way we see them, but the way we see them is a delusion or an illusion created by our sensory apparatus. Uh, The fact is, of course, that the Earth is rotating on its axis, and in relative terms, the Sun is in a stationary state, and so the Sun's not rising in the east, the Earth is simply rotating under it. Mm -hmm. And yet what we perceive is what we take to be real. Now, that happens in every domain of human understanding. Every discipline in our academic institutions, economics, biology, physics, chemistry, all of these are social constructs. Everything we've learned in those disciplines are social constructs. Every political ideology, capitalism, uh, neoliberal economics, all of these things, communism, these are social constructs, Mm -hmm. a set of beliefs. Each of them is a separate set of beliefs values and assumptions about the nature of reality, about the nature of the economy, about the nature of society, and so on and so forth. Uh, religious doctrines, whether it's you know Judaism or Christianity or Islam, all of these are, are stories made up by human beings, but believed in profoundly by their acolytes, the people who, who subscribe to each of those stories. So even though human beings make up the realities from which they live, all right, please understand me, mm-hmm. everybody lives out of a disciplinary 
paradigm or a political ideology or a religious uh, doctrine. In fact, we live out of all of those things simultaneously. It's all made up stories mm -hmm. that may or may not correspond to the nature of some important aspect of reality. So we're a very weird species mm -hmm. in so far as we socially construct the realities out of which we act. And those realities may or may not fit the planet in which we live. So just to give a very concrete example, right now the world is largely being dominated and run by a, a, an economic paradigm called neoliberal economics. And its fundamental underpinnings, by the way, it's, it's the economics of, of, of capitalism, mm -hmm. are that uh, we can grow forever, that the, that the economy can grow forever, money is just an abstract concept after all, and that the human ingenuity Human ingenuity is our greatest resource because through technology, we can always substitute for nature or find resources that didn't previously exist. And so there are no constraints on the human enterprise. Well, that's a model of reality. It's the one out of which the world economy is operating. And yet that model, and indeed all of the models of neoliberal e economics, none of them contain any profoundly useful information about the structure or the um, biophysical dynamics of the ecosystems with which the economy interacts in the real world. So we're really operating out of a model of reality that does not map to the biophysical reality within which the economy operates. And then we tend to be surprised as to why everything is, is screwing up. Uh, it's just a, an incredible <laughs> naive situation in many respects. And yet that's the way we are. And I could go on like this for hours because there's dozens of other reasons why human beings simply don't pay any attention on the whole to the nature of, of reality as our science tells us because it would interfere with the nature of reality that we've created as a, as a means of lifestyle, as an economic paradigm and so on and so forth. We do not like uh, well, that's a whole other thing. Human beings are habitual creatures. Mm -hmm. So once we've established a habitual pattern that, that is familiar, that's comfortable, uh, once we've socially constructed expectations that everything is going to get better, uh, and when you map that to the fact that we are natural optimists, you know, anybody who's born a, a total pessimist probably wouldn't survive very long. So we're naturally optimistic. When you uh, tie our natural optimism to... Uh, socially constructed paradigms of infinite growth and the technology will save us, then it takes a huge amount of evidence to make a dent in our actual behavior. Mm. So the bottom line, Patrick, is that humans tend to behave much more out of their instincts and their emotional attachments to socially constructed realities. We behave much more according to those things than we do to raw crude scientific data that says the climate is changing, the fish stocks are dying, the planet is being eroded under our feet. It, it, we just want to shy away from those kinds of things. I'll give you one more because yeah. I think it really is important. I've, I've already emphasized that we socially construct our realities. What cognitive neuroscience tells us today is that once you've heard a, a particular idea or once a, a particular thought pattern is repeated over and over and over again, it actually acquires a physical structure in the brain. So that thinking a particular way habitually uh, creates neural networks, synaptic circuitry, that reflects or embeds in the brain that pattern of thinking. And uh, once you have that ingrained in your mind, and by the way, again, think religious ideology, mm -hmm. or rather religious doctrine or political ideology or academic paradigm, once that patterned way of thinking is there, human beings have a natural tendency to seek out other people who think and believe the same way and to uh, immerse themselves in experiences that reinforce their pre-existing neural pathways. So we learn through the social construction of reality to create reliable social pathways or neural networks in our brains and then stick to them. Mm. And once we've got these embedded ways of thinking in our heads, we tend to deny, forget, or ignore contrary information. Mm. So you can see 
reason after reason, piled one after the other, reinforces a tendency of, of a kind of behavioral conservatism when it comes to uh, facing up to the realities of our ecological dilemma. It, it has to do with biology, it has to do with social paradigm, it has to do with our economic beliefs, and it has to do with the, the cognitive biology, which was once very adaptive. And keep in mind that, you know, again, 10,000 years ago, it, it probably was highly adaptive for an individual to learn the myths, the stories, the, the uh, cultural norms of their little tribe, because that gave you a sense of belonging. It gave you a sense of security. It, it caused the tribal cohesion, social cohesion. So all of these patterns, which are currently maladaptive that are driving us to the brink of extinction potentially used to be highly adaptive and that's because they evolved in a very different set of environmental circumstances when human populations were small when technology had no impact and when humans had almost no influence whatsoever on their environments it was okay to become uh, in, you know entrained particular set of beliefs, values, assumptions, and myths, and so on, it, it created group security and gave one a sense of identity. Today, those same qualities in a crowded planet that uh, is writhing in agony because of the overuse by human beings, uh, these things have become maladaptive because it blinds us to the seriousness of our own situation. So as you can uh, hear there, there are some obvious uh, cognitive blind spots that we have collectively. We then have to ask, well, what, what are we capable of? Are we just capable of blindness, of ignorance, of violence, of all these things? And certainly that's, that's on the table, isn't it? But I also like to highlight in this the fact that human beings are we're capable of many things. And there are many examples that we can look to of how human beings have managed crisis before, managed themselves through disasters. And we can look to contemporary examples. These are groups, these are organizations, these are structures, and these are people that maybe are not highlighted nearly as much as I think they should be. But these are people who are trying to, to encourage the best aspects of human nature. Yes, we are capable of cognitive blindness. Of course, we're capable of, of basically willingly walking off the cliff. And we are certainly capable of violence towards one another and towards creating artificial differences and artificial separations between ourselves. But that serves the ruling class. That serves the wealthy. That's how it's always worked. Going back to the beginning, we talked about the earliest days of colonization, uh, of slavery. Uh, there had to be justifications made in order to separate slaves from the white servant class, the white serfs. I mean, there wasn't this 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 definition really of of whiteness versus blackness. There was nothing like that. They had to be legally had to be legally created and and um, enforced by the state, and it served the ruling classes up to this point for it to be that way. So when we look at disaster situations, we just assume, kind of through this Hobbesian lens, that people are just going to start killing each other. And what this next uh, segment here I'm going to feature. Uh, kind of highlights is that there are organizations and ways of of providing aid uh, that actually encourage this other side of human nature, the side of solidarity, the side of cooperation. In this upcoming segment, I'm going to be featuring Desiree Lynn. Desiree uh, was featured in the episode 161, Solidarity Not Charity, Mutual Aid Disaster Relief, A Factor of Evolution. And Desiree, she is an activist, a street medic, and a co-organizer with Mutual Aid Disaster Relief. Kind of a, a succinct description of Mutual Aid Disaster Relief is a national network made up of many eco-activists, social justice activists, global justice activists, community organizers, and others who are actively organizing around supporting disaster survivors in the spirit of mutual aid and solidarity. Uh, and Mutual Aid Disaster Relief is a decentralized network. So the idea is like when there's a say, a climate disaster, right? You go to some place that's been flooded, mutual aid disaster relief shows up, and it's just a bunch of volunteers. And they're like, hey, what do you need? Instead of going through this NGO or this government agency like FEMA to provide all the supplies needed through this sort of centralized agency, what mutual aid disaster relief is doing is like, what do you need? Oh, you need water? Okay, we'll get that to you. You need food? We'll get that to you. You need the power back on? We'll do what we can to provide power. They show up and they say, hey, we don't need 
governments. We don't need nonprofits to be able to do this. Communities automatically start to function when the veneer of, I know this sounds contradictory, but the veneer of civilization and the veneer of, of organized society, when that disappears, people can do different things. They're capable of different things. But one thing they are certainly capable of is communally aiding one another to work within the community to to find the resources required to provide some sort of sustenance and stability to those in it. That is what Mutually Disaster Relief is enhancing. And I really wanted to focus on that in this interview with her so that we could explain what, what is possible. If we can think about what we want in this world, if we can think about the most beautiful way that we can handle these crises as they emerge, as these disasters emerge, right? Mutually Disaster Relief provides that model. They're one of several. So in this, we kind of discuss a little bit of human nature and, uh, you know, solidarity, not charity. This idea of, of doing this on the ground level in a decentralized fashion, I mean, if you want to put that in a, politi- in a political context, that's anarchism in practice. And that goes in this whole idea we discussed about mutual aid being something that's very natural in the human uh, the human experience. You know, that goes all, all the way back to one of the most famous anarchists, which was Peter Krop- Kropotkin. Kropotkin. Yeah, the, mm-hmm. the Russian anarchist. He was a, a prince, I guess, that kind of gave up his nobility to to sort of be a, an anarchist, uh, you know, among the people. And and he had he had written this, this book, you know, uh, Mutual Aid, A Factor of Evolution, which sort of makes the very very, uh, you know, it still holds up to this day, this idea that mutual aid is, it is, it is a factor of evolution. And that fits into this anarchist principle, this understanding that people don't thrive or don't do as well. They don't develop fully into the human beings that they truly could be under a top-down hierarchical oppressive um, institutions um, and, and form of social organizing. And I think that what uh, what this this network you're a part of is embodying those notions in disaster relief. And to say, like you said, there's an intersection between you know uh, maybe prison abolition or or any of these other things that uh, other organizations and other movements that exist, which apply those same principles but to different issues. But there is an obvious intersection between what you're a part of and what these other organizations, other movements are a part of as well. Um, and, and I think that that needs to come across that people can understand that when a disaster strikes, that the, the best way to approach these situations, um, is through this sort of anarchist principle, this anarchist perspective. And I think that's important to get across because people have, I think, a false understanding or false, um, uh, yeah, just a false perspective of what it means to be an anarchist and what it means to act as an anarchist, particularly in these disaster scenarios. Um, If you wanted to maybe comment on the principles of mutual aid, the principles of this disaster relief network uh, regarding maybe anarchism and what what we would maybe frame as radical political ideas. Right. And I, I mean, I wouldn't attach, although... I I don't like naming like mm, yeah. um you know because there are folks from different political ideologies and socio political ideologies that are involved in this autonomous because it is you know reverting to a natural state of being is you know what you know cooperation um but I I mean uh, principles of mutual aid it's like it's not just like the name of the group this is a way of being this is um like i said it's solidarity not charity so we believe that rather than treating um survivors of climate catastrophe as you know consumers and that they're powerless and that we're coming in and we're you know handing them things and then heading out we're understanding and respecting and um amplifying and supporting and backing the fact that people have a stake in their own survival and the rebuilding of their community they know their community so solidarity not charity is really important and it's it's really important in exercising dual power which is you know creating the world that we want to see while challenging and resisting the one that is currently here and currently wreaking you know, havoc and chaos on the rest of the people that are trying to, um, you know, struggle through it. Um, you know, so um, solidarity, not charity is like a major tenet of mutual aid. Um, mm-hmm. And 
um, and being being um, vocal against places that subsume, like I said, resources and and create bottlenecks. Um, another thing is, you know. Um, being survivor centric, listening to communities and letting, you know, um, those autonomous movements, um, be the ones that are leading the efforts and supporting those efforts and, um, moving with those efforts, horizontality and working on like a consensus based decision-making process. You know, there are no hierarchical structures in, um, you know, in, in acting when you're acting with, you know, mutual aid, um, you know, not just on a, in a disaster context, but, if you see capitalism itself as a disaster and the things that we have to endure, you know, like a mass incarceration and concentrated poverty, environmental racism, and all these issues that come about because of capitalism, um, you know, so working in um, a, a consensus based way, everyone is being heard and, um, you know, we're being able to make decisions not based on, um, you know, a, a top down way where people are being told what they need and people being told what, you know, kind of the direct inverse of what places like FEMA are doing. Um, so yeah, consensus based decision making process, solidarity, not charity, autonomy, um, and being survivor centric and listening to communities and supporting and amplifying those efforts is really what um mutual aid, you know, the the most succinct way that I can express what what the the ideology behind the, the, this movement is. So as Desiree explained there, it's about not only helping people where they're at, but it's also expressing and showing what is possible, what world exists that we can create. You know, we can choose to show in even the most difficult of circumstances what people are truly capable of, that we can, in fact, move away from these top-down hierarchical structures. And like Going back to the beginning again, understanding the history of where these top-down hierarchies have led us, they've led us to the ecological crisis. They have led us to these situations in which we don't know how to proceed because every, every option available to us has been burned out. In providing relief and in providing aid to those that are experiencing disaster, that are experiencing the onslaught of climate chaos, ecological collapse in this time that we're in. And so in in times of disaster and times of crisis, we can actually use these moments to demonstrate what we're really capable of. This other side of human nature that has been de-emphasized in this sort of scarcity model that is produced through capitalism. This idea that we don't have enough and that, that greed is a natural human state and not actually a response to certain material conditions, right? People actually want to help each other when they're given the right circumstances to do it. So it's all about emphasizing those qualities in human nature. And especially as we enter into a time of climate crisis, of ecological crisis, of political and social crisis, this is the stuff that we need to emphasize, we need to build these networks and these organizations that are capable of doing this. And often they come under, uh, they're, not, they're not really appreciated. They're often doing invisible, but altogether important work. So uh, I really liked speaking with Desiree, and I really appreciate her perspective and kind of staying in line with this. You know, it's not just a matter of, of mutual aid in disasters, right? It's like, we shouldn't just be doing this when things go completely wrong and the entire infrastructure collapses. It's important to do it then, but it's also really important to be ahead of the game a little bit to actually recognize what this system is built on and what are the effective tactics required to to fight this thing. Whether we go under the name of capitalism, civilization itself, uh, patriarchy, whatever, whatever kind of framing we want to use, what are the actual tactics that we need to to use to get to a better place, a place of power where we can actually create networks of solidarity? And one thing that I wanted to really address in this podcast is to address the um, the notion of, of, of protest or uh, activism as being only legitimate if it's nonviolent. 
And I ended up picking up a book, uh, the title of which is How Nonviolence Protects the State, written by anarchist, activist, and, uh, and writer Peter Gelderloos. So I was able to get into contact with him, and so I featured him in episode 166, How Nonviolence Protects the State, an Analysis of Early State Formation. And so in that book, he just dispels all of the rather irrational and foolish perspectives that people have adopted regarding violence, or what violence even is. He does a really great job of breaking down the really huge misconceptions that people have about what actually gets things done. This isn't an advocation for wild, random violence. This isn't an advocation for that. It's just really to understand that, one, the term nonviolence is really blurry and vague, and it's really a question of, well, who actually is legitimately wielding violence and who is not legitimate in wielding that violence. Often it's the state that has the monopoly on violence. And so often these these nonviolent protests, whatever you want to call them, it's not that, that it's ineffective. It's more like it is one piece of a larger picture. So when we talk about diversity of tactics, I think that's such a, it's a blanket term to describe a lot of things. I, I remember when the Occupy movement was was going on uh, back in what 2011, or I guess it was. Uh, you know, there was a real debate, and I don't think all of the occupations were having this debate. But I know in I think it would maybe in Occupy Oakland there may have been a more robust debate about this. But this idea that you know sitting in a park all day um, and and trying to not get arrested by the police isn't going to really do anything. You know, we, this, uh, this movement needs to evolve. It needs to move in a different direction. Uh, we need to incorporate different tactics. Um, and I remember there was, that was really when the division, I feel like the division within the movement really became apparent. And then it kind of started to disintegrate after that point. So this argument that maybe nonviolent activists would have is that as soon as movements become violent, that is when, we begin to see problems. That's when we begin to see more state repression. That's when we begin to see more divisions within the organizations uh, themselves. Uh, you know, what would you say to that? I would say that in the U.S., uh, the the Occupy occupations that lasted the longest, that uh, accomplished the most, uh, and that engaged the most people were precisely those ones that used the diversity of tactics and didn't constrain themselves to nonviolence. Um, I would also say that they have uh, an extremely naive reactionary view of the state. The state is not a passive uh, set of institutions. Uh, it doesn't just sit there waiting for people to start misbehaving before punishing them. Uh, all modern states use a, a counterinsurgency philosophy with regard to their own populations. In other words, they view their own populations as a constant threat that they have to... Uh, um, systematically and, and continuously uh, surveil discipline and, and repress. Repression is, is an everyday activity. So um, uh, Europe makes uh, a, an interesting uh, sort of laboratory or set of case studies because you have um, a lot of countries right next to each other that are economically very similar, um, but with, uh, with very different histories of their social movements and um, and different uh, political strategies, strategies used by their their state, uh, their states, the um, the countries in Europe with um, with the most repression, with the strongest police presence, with with the most invasive police presence in in the lives of the citizens, like the most social control. Um, I would argue uh, would be the the UK, uh, Germany. Um, the Netherlands, Switzerland, um, and the some of these countries that have certainly had uh, strong um, strong social movements in the past. But uh, if you look at the years in which there's social peace, in which there's not a lot of conflict, there aren't strong social movements in those countries. Uh, state repression advances by leaps and bounds. Whereas if you look at the European countries. Um, where there are constant uprisings, constant resistance, people constantly fighting back. Uh, in those countries, more often than not, the states are less able to develop their repressive capacities, to increase their repressive capacities, because people just don't let them. Um, 
So states don't just wait around until there's a revolutionary movement to start being repressive. Uh, we can also look at the color revolutions, um, which were these uh, pacifist, very reformist, very pro-West, pro-US, uh, and US-funded um, movements following the, um, the Gene Sharp template for, um, for peaceful regime change, um, which is basically the number one um, version of, of nonviolence today, like uh, Gandhian nonviolence, uh, nonviolence that was uh, represented or, or developed in the U.S. civil rights movement. Those are um, um, not really present uh, hardly anywhere on the world stage today. So if we talk about nonviolent movements today, they're almost exclusively using uh, Gene Sharp's methodology. Um, so we can look at the places where those movements stayed completely peaceful. Um, the decision to use repression or not was a political decision. It was never a decision based on, is this movement violent? Is it not violent? Oh shoot, this movement's not violent, so we just can't repress it. Uh, tell it to the people in Belarus. Uh, Belarus, um, politically, didn't have as much to lose from repressing the movement because they have closer political and economic ties with Russia. They didn't need to curry favor with the European Union or NATO. Uh, they sent out the police, and that movement couldn't even stand up to police repression. The, the government didn't even have to send in the military. Um, and they, they didn't suffer uh, long-lasting consequences for that. Um, so, so, I mean, we can, just in the last 10 or 20 years, you can find all the examples you want of perfectly peaceful movements that were repressed um, uh, by the state based on political considerations, and time and again, those nonviolent movements were completely unable to defend themselves from state repression. I really enjoyed that interview with Peter. I, I really, really, truly appreciate his work and that book, How Nonviolence Protects the State. I recommend everybody who's interested in any kind of activism to check that out. Uh, he really just dispels a lot of the myths that surround uh, effective action. Now, the next segment here I want to feature is with Corey Morningstar. She's an investigative journalist, and I featured her in episode 188 of the podcast, For Your Consent, Climate Activism, and the Financialization of Nature. We discuss her extensive six-act expose, The Manufacturing of Greta Thunberg for Consent, and it was published at Wrong Kind of Green, and it examines the nonprofit industrial complex and its relationship with contemporary climate activism. So in going from what Peter discussed there regarding using a diversity of tactics and understanding that all effective, major effective changes that have happened through activism have happened through this diversity of tactics not being limited to, quote, nonviolence by itself, we then can look at the climate movement or the, the environmental movement, and we can see how it's being shaped and formed before our very eyes. Corey has done in her work as she's exposed it's not even about Greta you know she's really trying to expose the people behind Greta uh, the various nonprofit organizations the various tech startups and just other corporations and billionaires the billionaire class the elite that have a vested interest in maintaining the global capitalist system and these people are very very aware that global uh, climate change is making capitalism obsolete uh, not just capitalism but the whole human enterprise right so there's been a real emphasis on reframing environmentalism and environmental activism within the context that has been provided by these nonprofits, which are again backed by billionaires backed by the capitalist class and so nonviolence is is used as a as a way of of kind of pitching this idea to young people and to people that are very concerned about the climate crisis that like there are ways there are organizations that you can join that you can channel your anger channel your frustrations channel your passions into and what Corey has done over years and years of research not just in the six act expose but over the course of her investigative journalistic career is expose the ways in which nonprofits are there to perpetuate capitalism. And we need to understand that capitalism 
does not go with sustainability. There's no such thing as sustainable capitalism. And there is also no such thing as green energy, as we're going to get into here in the next segment after this one. The way that it's been pitched to us is that we can transition over to a green capitalist economy. It's not really feasible or possible to do that. And there's a lot of reasons for that. In this segment, Corey goes over uh, some of her work and some of her ideas and what has really been happening, what we've been seeing with the climate movement, the climate justice movement, um, and how a lot of this is just social engineering. It sounds conspiratorial, but when you step back and look at the context of where we are at today and how all of our issues, environmental, climate issues, are framed within the context of saving a system that is actually creating the very problem itself, we need to step back and analyze, well, what what does effective action look like? It may not be popular. It may not be something that is covered and put at the, on the front page of The Guardian or The New York Times. You know, you may not have representatives go and speak in front of COP whatever and, and the World Economic Forum. No. We're, we're, what are we actually doing this for? You know, are we doing it to, to save the system? Or are we trying to do it because we love the earth? Yeah, I know we hammered on this, but I just want to say, like, there's, there's a quote from Act 2 that I just want to read here. Um, the prime example of one of the main, oh, this is a prime example of one of the main functions of NGOs to generate popular demand from the citizenry that will turn, uh, will in turn support the legislation required for projects that serve to benefit industry rather than people and planet. Prior to contracts being signed or a shovel breaking ground to build the infrastructures that will comprise the, quote, global architecture in the age of the fourth industrial revolution, re- legislation is required. And just like a proverbial snowball turning into an avalanche, the legislation begets money for a budget with bidding and construction to commence shortly thereafter. I think this tie that into because again another buzzword another thing that's being discussed a lot in great part because of alexandria ocasio cortez representative of new york um here in the united states um you know she, she, for for whatever you think about her she is somebody who has garnered a lot of attention whether she's meant to or not you know i mean she's just she says things as they are true or not but she's garnered a lot of attention and she's proposed or at least she's been one of the big names behind what has been called the Green New Deal. Of course, the Green New Deal is referencing, of course, to FDR's New Deal back during the 1930s, during the Great Depression, when a massive amount of infrastructure projects, you know, trying to get jobs, get people, get the economy moving again to get us out of the Great Depression, which, of course, you know, within a decade, the United States was in World War II, which was actually the thing that got the United States economy and the global economy, I guess, to a great degree as well back in shape, you know, got it going, got everything moving again. Um, uh, and so when pe- when we say something like a Green New Deal, what exactly is being um, discussed here? What is the Green New Deal? So that's just getting really, that you know, that's actually getting everyone really, really hyped about, oh, we're finally, you know, people finally care about climate and environment and about minorities and all this. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just call her AOC. AOC, anyway. yeah. At AOC, she, you know, is basically the new, um, more hip version of Obama, right? Like this time you can believe this time it's really different this time, you know, like you can be sure she'll run. I don't know when your next election is in the States, but she'll definitely, if she's um, old enough at that time, she'll be running. I mean, I have no doubt she'll probably become president. She's not, she didn't even help write that proposal. It's like I said, it was written by Data for Progress with Sunrise Movement, who is Sierra Club. And um, even World Resources Institute had their hand in that. World Resources Institute is one of the key people behind the fourth industrial revolution, behind everything, behind the financialization of nature. They're the ones with the arms, you know, out to the Council of Foreign Relations. Um, And another more key people involved with Alexandra Cortez. Is that her name? Alexandria (laughs) Ocasio Cortez, yep. I know she has a huge deal where you are, but yeah, Yeah. not so much. (laughs) Um, So, anyway, even um, Zach Exley, who comes from Move On, 
and New Organizing Institute, both found, um, move on, founded the New Organizing Institute, plus it's a co-founder of Avaz, and he, he's from there. Like, you've got these same people from Harvard, the UN, from the McKinsey Institute. Um, the other co-founder of Avaz, Tom Periello, used to, you know, you have pictures of him with Obama. You have pictures of him in Africa, you know, in Burundi. Like, they are... It's amazing how such a small, interconnected people um, group of people with this elite status are really running the show. And then lately, you've got Zach Exley. And the reason I brought him up, not only did he help craft that, um, like he's basically his new organization called New, new Consensus is the brains behind um AOC, mm. is that her name? A- yeah. Sorry, I keep forgetting. No, you're good. It's um, a- a- AOC. AOC, yep. Right? And so just um, in the past few days, he was just over with the UK Labour Party with Jeremy Corbyn um, doing a new Green Deal there. And then you can go back and you can find right from the lips of Paul Hilder, his avaz and purpose, um, purpose instrumental in devising the horrific group in both the okay so basically the creation of the white helmets through purpose which is avaz um you've got and you know avaz has been horrific in the destabilization of target targeted countries by empire i mean they're just up to their necks in blood like libya syria bolivia um and africa and those are other things i've written about but going back to Paul Hilder, then you've got him saying the New Green Deal, they were polling with Avaz members in 2009, 10 years ago. So again, like, you know, this stuff's all in the in the making, in the works. And another thing I, I think we should add, too, is just how big of a part of the um, new climate economy genetically modified food will be. Okay. Still, right? That's another huge component. Oh. So, I mean... People in their minds say, oh, Green New Deal, and they think, you know, beautiful, beautiful windmills and turbines and all these things made from butterfly kisses, right? (laughs) And they don't even realize, no, it's really bad shit that's gonna that's gonna come it's gonna make everything accelerate it's gonna make everything worse yeah well i wanted to ask because you know all of this as you mentioned it's in the works it's been going on for a decade or so however long it's been this has been kind of fleshed out um you know we're seeing a, a emotional emotional manipulation and a fear as a means of starting the quote world war ii level you know response to to what's happening and you framed it as like an emergency mode you know how do we get people and this is something that greta thunberg i mean f- whatever i i don't want to pick on her because it's not about her it's about the words though that she uses which is like the house is on fire and yet no one is running for the door you know no one is reacting as if our house is on fire um you know nobody is did you, did you see that part in part four I, that's part four right yeah i believe so yeah yeah the, um, the strategy to create the climate emergency yeah yeah Greta's is basically almost verbatim saying what's right out of that booklet yep like you know it's it's just um it's really grotesque to see um a young person exploited to such an extent so I imagine um, if you haven't heard that interview with Corey before, then maybe some of the things that were discussed make some sense, but some things don't. So I, again, like I mentioned before, I played that segment. You really have to read that six act expose in discussing, you know, as Corey mentioned, the Green New Deal, right? Um, uh, the Green New Deal being proposed uh, as a way to curb the worst impacts of global climate change and environmental degradation to the uh, U.S. economy, in particular, the Green New Deal, as discussed within the context of, of the United States. The Green New Deal is sort of a measure, it's very expensive, and it's, you know, it's a World War II level response, essentially, to climate change. It's, just, it's, it's trying to move the U.S. economy over to sustainable energies, green technologies, to get away from carbon emissions. Now, I had an interview as of the recording of this episode, it wasn't very long ago, but I just wanted to supplement this, this idea of what Corey brings up about the Green New Deal, getting people ready 
for what's coming, what these individuals, these capitalists really want to do, which is turn everything ultimately. I mean, the logic of the system is to turn everything into capital, turn everything into something that could be bought and sold in a marketplace. We are so detached from the ways in which our lifestyle is generated for us. We don't really understand how energy is produced or what's actually required to get the products that we all buy. And we're all implicated in this. I mean, we're all we're all participating in this system, some more involved than others, I will say. Um, but we're all connected to this. And so when we think about moving over to sustainable energy, there are hidden costs. And they're not actually that hidden. If you want to look, you can see them. But there are costs that come with the Green New Deal, moving over to wind, uh, solar, biofuels, all of these different so-called green energy sources. There are massive costs that come with that, and they are not green in how they're produced. They're not sustainable in how they're produced. For us to get the minerals required to make solar panels, to make wind turbines, to, uh, to do biofuels, for instance, which require massive deforestation often, and also growing uh, crops that uh, are used exclusively for energy production, you know, however those biofuels are produced. It's an incredibly energy intensive process. As the next guest, I'm going to feature is Jasper Burns. Uh, as Jasper frames it, they're, they're sacrifice zones, places where mines are at, where they extract all these minerals, and it's just a toxic, wasteful thing. It's It's terrible honestly. And it's all framed within capitalism. It's all framed within saving the capitalist system. Just like the original New Deal back in the 1930s with FDR trying to pull the United States out of the economic depression that it was in, of course, which led to World War II. And that was actually the thing that got us out of that. But as Jasper explains in his article published in Commune Magazine, Between the Devil and the Green New Deal, Jasper explains what is actually required to produce these energy sources. So I'm putting this all in your mind so that you can understand that the solutions, there really aren't any, at least not within the the framing that we're often given within popular culture, within the media as we understand it. So with all the hype that surrounds the Green New Deal, you've got the nonprofits that are that are trying to push it as a way to further an agenda. But you also have just the the obvious costs that come with it that are not discussed very openly. And so in this upcoming segment, it is from episode 198, Sacrifice Zones Between the Devil and the Green New Deal with Jasper Burns, who is the managing editor of Commune Magazine. Well, to make, you know, to make a solar panel, uh, it really depends on what kind of panel you're making. Uh, there's there's numerous different process, but but um, all of them require a kind of mix of exotic and uh, prosaic metals, um, you know, that are largely mined only in specific places on the planet, and and that's not always because the the minerals are rare. It's because mines are so environmentally destructive that most people don't want to mine anywhere near them, right? So so there's 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 places where the country is poor enough or the the, the, the people are oppressed enough that somebody has decided they'll just ruin everything by putting a mine there. Uh, and these are sort of kind of sacrifice zones um, that are just, you know, rendered toxic so the rest of the, the world can uh, benefit from the, the resources that are, that are coming from there. So, you know, it's, um, it, takes, it takes a lot of metal to make a solar panel, <clears throat> And it takes a lot of energy to, to mine those metals and to refine them too. Oftentimes that energy, it's hard to make it renewable because it's gasoline and you would have to replace it with a kind of gas substitute like a biofuel, which takes a lot of acres to produce. Uh, you can't simply, you know, you, taking construction and mining equipment and making it uh, run on electricity is a, a, a very difficult technical problem that we're probably uh, not very close to solving. So, you know, so, so that's going to kind of cut into the benefits of, you know, going renewable. Um, then you're going to have to ship that stuff all, all the way across the planet. Um, and then you have to replace it. A solar panel only lasts for a certain number of years. Some of them are about 10 years, some 15. Uh, you're going to have to replace it. Uh, and, you know, and if you do it, if you, if you install them incorrectly or something like that, that's just waste. So, you know, you have to, you have to really think about that, that calculation. Um, <clears throat> 
and it's the same is true for um, wind turbines. Uh, they quite they require a lot of resources and investment up front, and they use a lot more. They take up a lot more space than a oil refinery, as it were. Well, if I could ask this, because I think one of the main arguments that I've heard from those that are proposing these technologies is they say, well, eventually it'll get better, right? We'll have more efficient solar panels that'll be able to store, uh, produce, and we'll bat- be able to produce more energy, and we'll have batteries that'll be able to store more of that energy, and we'll be able to to basically get away from these problems eventually. Um, what do you say to that? Because that, that to me is always an, an argument that I'm always like, well, I, I get where you're coming from, but I, yeah, I think that's I think that that's um, I think that that's completely ludicrous, uh, especially when you talk about storage. One of the problems with renewables um, is that uh, they're not continuous and they're not consistent and they're not scalable. Um, or what the energy systems people call dispatchable, right? With a with a you know coal burning plant, you can simply start. If you need to generate more electricity, you can just burn more coal, just shovel more coal into it. Um, but you can't make the sun shine more or the wind blow more, right? So um, you don't have the same kind of abstract capacity to to, to generate more um, energy if you need it. And of course, sometimes the wind isn't blowing, and for half of uh, the day, half of our, you know, our uh, the time on the planet, the sun isn't shining in particular places. And so you have to deal with that problem. Now, you could um, store energy in batteries or you could send it halfway around the world. But that, if you start, to, if you start adding in that um, technology for storage or transmission, then you're talking about an incredible use of resources. Um, and it's also not clear that it'll be, you know, it will take you even longer to become um, carbon zero, right? Because you're using so many resources to, and that's where that's where it really becomes impossible. Not only kind of impossibly expensive within capitalism, but also just technically, um, you're you're using so many resources to get energy, and you're using so many energy, so much energy to get those resources that it may not really be uh, of benefit. At least with you know battery battery technologies that that we have now. Um, <clears throat> So there are other, I mean, there are other ways and maybe, you know, I'm not saying this stuff, all of this stuff will be useful. We're going to need to, you know, we're going to need to transform the energy system and we'll need to use renewables and we'll probably have um, some methods for storage. Um, but, you know, I, I, th- I think that that is simply kind of wishful thinking that we're going to be able to, to transmit and store our way around the problem. You know, I really thank Jasper for, one, writing that piece. It's incredible. I recommend reading it um, and uh, for going over that information, just sort of illuminating that there's always costs to this. And if we don't include those costs into our systems in the way that we conduct our lives collectively on this planet, then we're going to continue to push them outside of our sphere of awareness until they eventually become so big and so problematic for our way of life that it in fact can (laughs) disrupt all life on the planet. And that's essentially what capitalism has produced. And that's what this so-called green energy thing that they're pushing down our throats uh, is going to do as well. It's, it's not going to change. And so, and so this next segment uh, is with Reed Wildermuth and Reed is somebody I've interviewed, I think like four times. I think he's probably been the most interviewed guest on my podcast up to this point. I've had people on numerous times, but I think, yeah, I think he's been on about four times. And so Reed has been pretty influential in how I've approached a lot of different subjects. Reed is the co-founder of Gods and Radicals, and it calls itself an anti-capitalist pagan site of beautiful resistance. I think I'm kind of mashing some different things together there, but it is a pagan thing. So and so I think Reed's point of view regarding animism and paganism, uh, which is just to sort of view everything as being imbued with consciousness or spirituality. Um, everything is, is alive. Everything is connected in some form or another. And there's different ways of explaining this. I, I once had an interview with a psychedelic uh, philosopher who I am not featuring in this episode, but... Um, 
Peter Shostedich, he, he comes from a tradition of Western philosophy called panpsychism, which is essentially a, a similar idea, which is that everything is a part of this field of consciousness. And if we're going to really address the ecological crisis that we're in the midst of, these technological solutions that are being pitched to us and that we're supposed to believe are going to somehow fix this crisis that we're in, which we can't. You know, Reed has pointed to a different way of understanding the crisis by calling upon older spiritual religious traditions that can be kind of defined under the umbrella term paganism, you know, acknowledging that there is a spiritual dimension to this, and also to recognize that to be truly materialist, to actually believe in the material world as being the world itself, is to recognize there is this spiritual dimension to it, that to separate spirit from matter is a, is a huge error, and that that itself is one of the underlying assumptions of the global economic paradigm that we've been born into that material reality is something to be dominated and to be controlled and to be dissected into its various parts in order to be understood. On this progress narrative that we've been on to the present moment, we assume that things are getting better, but that is a narrative. That is a story that we tell ourselves. As I explored earlier in this episode with Sylvia Federici a little bit, Reed kind of expounds on that in a lot of ways. You know, I interviewed him recently, uh, and this segment I'm going to play here is from episode 197, All That is Sacred is Profaned, Marxism, Paganism, and History as Process. This, in great part, is inspired by his book, All That is Sacred is Profaned, A Pagan Guide to Marxism, which I think as of the release of this episode will be out. Uh, the hidden relationships that we have with the material world and how, how things are produced in a global capitalist economy that we have to recognize that the ways in which things are produced, the ways in which material objects are formed for our use, for our consumption, has a spiritual quality to it. That the material objects that we receive from exploited workers in China, for example, or any other part of the world in which people are paid next to nothing to produce products that we consume and buy here in the West, that those objects carry that quality with them and that capitalism produces alienation and separation. So Reed in this segment here is going to describe a little bit of that worldview, which I think is really important. We need to reclaim that worldview. We need to embody it. And by doing that, it, it can completely reshape how we approach everything. In, in one of the chapters, uh, uh, actually the third chapter, um, where I introduce the idea of, of um, you, know, you know, what is meant by Marxist historical materialism um, and, and what is meant by the, the materialism itself within Marxism. Uh, you know, for a long time, like a communist, staunch con communist, whatever, like they saw materialism as being kind of an atheist um, you know, the, the religion, superstition, anything else like that, when, when we're talking about uh, circumstances, um, about the way the world is, just gets in the way and it's all illusion. But w w when you, when you re-inject animism, which, you know, animism is ultimately a materialist philosophy because, you know, material, like, they don't see a, a, a distinction between the material and the spirit. So, like, when they're looking at material, that is also spirit. Like, that is also, you know, that is a living thing, the tree the tree is, is, is not just a thing. It's not reduced to anything. It's, it's kind of constantly expanded, but you never forget that the, the tree is a living material thing. Um, you know, with, with that sort of materialism and animus materialism, as it were, yeah, you, you get that pink plastic fairy again, or, or the cell phone or whatever. And, 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 it holds the, the it holds the sorrow it holds the suffering it, it holds the exploitation of the workers who created it the the labor that went into that doesn't go away you know you you can't just ignore everything that that, that came before that <clears throat> and and the yeah, you know that was always kind of the brilliance of what marx was doing which was pointing out we have to look at the material circumstances that created a thing that created the the uh, the situations we're in now. We can't 
when when you put a, a level of ideology over it, when you put a, 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 a kind of a, a fantasy, um, you know, going back to that pink plastic fairy, like, oh, you know, it's it's kind of it's an offering to the fairies. It's like, no, it is petroleum that has been dyed pink and was shaped by poor Chinese workers who were being exploited, and then that was shipped around the world so you could buy that. That is what this thing is. You may be using it as an offering to the fairies or whatever, you know, but in actuality, your offering to the fairies is created by exploitation. And so you, you can't deny that whole thing. Um, and, and, and you can extend that to absolutely everything else. Like, you know, uh, with, with the abortion thing happening in the United States, like the, the official, the official idea, the official reason why why people want to stop abortion, it's like, oh, you know, because we believe that that uh, life begins at conception. That's an ideological overlay. That's a religious overlay. Um, you know, and then you could pick other ones like, well, we, you know, we don't think that women should be able to to do this. You know, they're they're killing life. All of the other explanations. You look at all of those, and then you look at the material circumstances that are actually creating that thing, and and what's what material need the rich and the government has for women or for, for, for people not to be able to choose their own reproductive activity, like whether or not they have a child or not, you know, and why they do that. And then you look at, at the larger circumstances, the larger material circumstances, and you see, oh, cheap labor. The more poor people you have, the lower wages go. The lower wages go the higher the profit is for a capitalist. You know, this is like just looking at the, the longer chain, I think, than, um, than, than accepting just the ideological, uh, fantastical overlay that, uh, that, that we put on it or that other people, the, the people oppressing us put on it, mm. things like that too. So in understanding the material conditions that produce the problems that we're experiencing today, we then have to ask, even with all of this happening, even with this understanding in place, the planet is changing irreversibly. Humanity is likely on the way out. You know, it's good to get a grasp on these things, but there's this just sense of despair that sets in when one really sits back and thinks like, well, what's the fucking point of all this? And so I wanted to tie, I don't even know how I would even tie what Reed said there in that segment with what's coming up here next, but I wanted to feature a discussion between myself, my friend Rob Simetz, and Dar Jamal. And I've already featured uh, a little bit of Dar Jamal previously where he just discussed the scientific information. But in our most recent interview, which I did back in January with in collaboration with Rob Simetz, who is host of Moving Forward on the Progressive Radio Network, we decided to do a collaborative interview this year with Dar Jamal. Um, But in this upcoming segment, and I think Dar, what he does is he says, even in spite of how tragic and difficult this all is and what's currently unfolding on this planet, we have obligations as people, as a species, to do the right thing. And doing the right thing doesn't mean that we believe in this outcome that's going to be beneficial for us. Do, Do you know what I mean? Doing the right thing, doing the sacred work, connecting to the land, connecting to all of the qualities of the material world that we're a part of, includes looking at and not looking away from what this civilization has produced. And learning to say goodbye is a big part of that. And that's what Dar essentially brings up in this upcoming segment. This is from episode 171 the end of ice bearing witness in the path of climate disruption in collaboration with Rob Simetz. You know, when my wife and I were driving up to Boise to fly here, we were having this discussion about um, intergenerational trauma. Sorry, I'm kind of getting off track slightly, but I'm thinking about all the various ways in which our culture has been built on all these faulty premises and maybe there's values that, that can we can come out of that that are good. You know, it isn't like we can necessarily throw everything out with the the you know the water or whatever. Um, but it's 
it seems to me that what climate change and this whole crisis is asking of us, the whole ecological crisis globally, is asking us something that is so deep and so profound. And my fear, what makes me so sad, is I don't know if people, most people, are going to come to that realization. And that's what scares me, mostly. It's not even that I'm worried about the extinction. I think that that may or may not happen. That's almost out of our hands at this point. What we can choose to do is to to figure out how do we live beautifully in the time that we have. And it's going to be really hard to do that when we have nuclear power plants along every coast in the United States and around the world. We have uh, re- you know ridiculous political institutions and, and uh, you know, a, a corporate capitalist mindset that runs the economy. Do you know what I mean? Like, it, it's so overwhelming. And this podcast has been almost... A blessing and a curse in that way. <laughs> I, I understand. I, I feel exactly the same about my climate writing online and and working on this book. And and it's it's. I think what you just articulated is uh, evidence of kind of this simultaneous world living that I think all of us have to engage in now. That mm. you know, here we are sitting here in a comfortable place, having this conversation. It's warm. We're dry. Um, we have our needs met right now, uh, and, and simu- with the simultaneous knowledge that uh, already there's people living on coasts that are having to leave. They're flooding. Climate change is upon them. Mm-hmm. Um, if you, or if you lived in Paradise, California, uh, places where you've already lost everything, like they're already living in the climate disrupted future that the rest of us who haven't uh, uh, experienced a direct extreme weather event, it's completely altered our lives we haven't gotten there yet so for us there's still this and for a lot of the culture there's still this well it's not here yet it's in the future it's out there and yet for increasing numbers of people around the world these numbers are increasing daily it's here they're living in what we perceive to be this 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 future and and yet at the same time those of us that have watched this coming and and really understand it deeply I feel like uh, we're getting a chance to kind of emotionally process it. Like we're on borrowed time and we're getting to let this sink in before these extreme weather events hit us. And, mm-hmm. and in some sense, you know, in, in my case, for example, even in the Pacific Northwest with the smoke in the summers from the wildfires, um, the acidifying oceans that's already hitting the, the shellfish industries up here, you know, it is already starting to happen. Um, and, and it's, how do you live in all these worlds simultaneously, you know? And then, you know, and the, the reality is, you know, I will leave this interview and get in my car and drive back home. Yeah. And, 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 you know, this is quite the psychological tight roping that I think all of us have to live in. And, and, you know, the, for me, it forces the issue of evolve, you know, like spiritually I have to evolve and, and constantly be talking to people about what's going on and processing grief and sharing it um, and, and laughing and crying and, and understanding that, yeah, this is a really, truly mad time to be on the planet. I can't imagine a more intense time to be on this planet than right now. Yeah. Well, and it seems like, too, um, you know, a lot of people, they call this the, the Anthropocene. And I know in your writings, you use the, the term ACD, Anthropogenic Climate Disruption. And it's all this definition of, well, what does the Anthropocene mean? And what do we do in this time? And um, I feel like this is an age where we're going to have to learn to say goodbye. And we are going to have to get out in nature to say goodbye properly. And it was a talk you you were interviewed on Counterpunch Radio a couple months back. And I remember you were wondering aloud, are there people that are making calculated decisions on where to move based off of what's happening with climate change. And I'm one of those people who did. Um, I lived in Florida and after Hurricane Irma came, I it just missed me and me and my wife looked at each other and said, never again. And we moved out here and I was almost in denial that this was a global situation. Um, I came out here and, you know, you see pictures of Oregon. I never really been, it's beautiful, but the silence was deafening. I, I haven't connected with wildlife here yet like I did in Florida. But you got to find the silver linings. Like you talked about last night when you were diving the Great Barrier Reef, there's areas where it's bleached, but there's areas where it's not. And the one silver lining I've found so far is there's this uh, hill called Mimalus Hills. Uh, It's about 60 miles down. And in the spring, there's just flowers everywhere. And you see bees everywhere pollinating the flowers. It's just beautiful. And 
if we're aware of these things, we're going to be able to say goodbye to that properly. So do you do you feel like you're you've been able to do that? That this book has kind of chronicled those moments for you? I do. I, I feel like the book put me in, provided me with this extraordinary privilege of getting to go to these amazing places in the world, like the Amazon, the Great Barrier Reef, Glacier National Park, um, <clears throat> Utkiagvik, Alaska, formerly known as Barrow. All these really incredible places that are changing before our very eyes, and in a lot of ways, many of them are going away. I mean, like there is no question that the entirety of South Florida will be underwater well before I die. No question. You know, if you look at what's happening already uh, in melt the melting of Greenland and the Antarctic and going to these places fully cognizant of all the science and what's happening and what's projected and knowing that no government on the earth is reacting the way it should be in, in the face of this crisis. And so a lot of these places, like when, when I was at the Great Barrier Reef, I really felt like, you know, I... I don't see myself coming back here. I don't, I don't know when it's going to happen. I, I intend to phase out flying altogether. And, and uh, I, I literally had this experience where I felt like I was saying goodbye to the reef. And I wrote about that in the book. And I feel like that's a tremendous pleasure. Um, and then at the same time, um, so again, here's like how many worlds do we need to try to live in at the same simultaneously? Also appreciating the beauty and just being with it, you know, because it, it's still here. It's still here, and we don't know when it will go away completely. In the case of the Great Barrier Reef, it looks like it's single-digit years at this point for sure. Um, well, for sure in quotes. It certainly looks that way, um, but it's still here. And, and so for me, when I'm writing uh, a hard article and, about the climate and I get overwhelmed and I can step outside of my house and it's surrounded by a bunch of big dug firs and hemlocks and cedars and just be it with the trees and just find solace in that. Like they're still here and I'm still here, you know? And just like I've been saying now on tour, what's coming up, it's like, well, if you're still here, I can still be here, you know? And that's also reason to keep doing whatever I can, regardless of the outlook of how bleak it is, how, how, how intensely it feels like we're doomed at times that regardless, I still feel morally obliged to do everything I can to try to help take care of the planet because we don't know for sure what's going to happen. And even if we did, even if we did, I, I would still get up and try to do the right thing simply because, um, you know, I want to go out on my feet and, and I want to have dignity and I want to be in right relations with the planet. So in discussing this, what does it mean to fulfill your obligations? as a person, as a human being, as a, as a member of this species. You know, don't listen to what the culture tells you about what your role is on this planet. You're not here to serve the capitalist paradigm. You're not. Now, obviously, you have to, to survive. <laughs> you know, you got to make a living, right, as they say. But that doesn't mean that's what you're here for. And I think we can look to the way other people live on this planet, still live on this planet, and how they have engaged in restoring cultural practices, spiritual practices that have connected them to the land, that have put them in balance and in harmony to a great degree with the land in which they are connected to. Earlier this year, there was an incident, which was uh, something I covered a couple of times on the podcast. I had two interviews. I had one with environmentalist Will Falk, who had visited the uh, Unistoten camp up in the British, so-called British Columbia up in Canada, which is a part of the, what, Suetzen uh, First Nations territory. So there's several different houses, several different groups that are a part of the Wet'suwet'en First Nation, the indigenous peoples of this region. And the Unistoten camp is a camp that was built purposely in the way of a pipeline project. It serves as one, as a, as a resistance camp, as in a way to stand in the way of this, this oil pipeline project that Canada was very fond pushing through, but also to, to address intergenerational trauma that the Wet'suwet'en had to have had to endure under colonialism, right? We we have to recognize that colonialism is an ongoing process. It never went away. Just because the conquistadors and all of the, you know, colonialist projects and settlers have already arrived doesn't mean that it's over. It's still ongoing. The Canadian government, the American government, all of the governments that have formed in the wake of colonialism are still perpetuating colonial policies 
it may come up in a different context than what we may have seen maybe 100 or 200 years ago, but I mean, it's essentially the same thing. And so earlier this year, when the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, uh, invaded sovereign First Nation territory of the Wet'suwet'en people in order to push through the construction of this pipeline, I mean, I, it was so, it really struck a chord with a lot of people. And so I really wanted to focus on that. And and in doing that interview, I, I, I sought out, first of all, I mentioned Will Falk, who had spent time at the Unistotin camp, and he provided a lot of context. But I ended up getting in contact with Dr. Carla Tate. She is a clinical psychologist. She's a director of programming for the Unistotin Healing Center and is a member of the Wet'suwet'en First Nation. She was featured in episode 169, Heal the Land, Heal the People, the Unistotin Healing Center. And she talks about her work as a clinical, as a, you know, Western clinical psychologist in the Western, you know, tradition. Um, and in kind of reconciling that with her indigenous identity as somebody who is using cultural and spiritual spiritual traditions that have been somewhat neglected over the past several generations as a way to heal. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. And I think for me as somebody who is a settler, essentially I'm a white person, I don't have these deep ancestral roots or connections, kind of like what I addressed earlier um, with the severance from our roots as a result of you know historical processes, as was discussed earlier in this episode. To look to other peoples, to indigenous peoples that are still have those cultural memories and are still working with them and revitalizing them. And in the face of ongoing government oppression, ongoing government violence, colonial violence, they are standing up and they're saying, no, we do not consent to this. And it's just incredibly beautiful and it's, it's heartbreaking. Well, I, I think the crux of it is that um, for what so within people and a lot of Indigenous people, and I, I hate to pan indigenize but I, I know that um, a great deal of uh, Indigenous people do center their identity and their culture um, on the land, right? And our, our relationship with the land. And so I think one of our, our challenges is that, you know, um, we've been deliberately um, removed from and disconnected from our land and culture time and time again since colonization. Um, you know, and that disconnection from our land um, leads to all sorts of economic and social uh, challenges and struggles for our communities. Um, I guess... I, I, I don't know how to put it into simple terms, but, you know, I, I think about all of the customs and the, the ceremony and the practices that we've, we have in our community that make us what's so with them and, and how much of them are, are linked back to our land and our territory. Um, I guess I'll share an example from my personal life. Um, you know, my, my daughter, uh, She's quite young, um, and we, you know, since Frida has moved back to our territory, it's really prompted us to do a bit of uh, revitalization of our own cultural practices within our Unistaten house. And so it's it's meant that we are coming back to, to um, engage in our annual action camps that, you know, focus on really um, reconnecting and, and protecting um, our traditional territories um, and, and meeting with other Indigenous people around that. Um, but also, you know, other aspects of, of wellness and, and um, strengthening that connection. So, uh, you know, we, we've had this cultural practice, this ceremony um, for our, our people that um, we've just brought back into practice within my, my house group through my daughter. And I think she's the first one that I can think of within um, two generations um, that we've actually carried this this uh, really um, ancient practice out with, um, and so that's a ceremony that you know really after her birth um, connected her to to the land, 
Um, and I won't share the, the finer details of it, but um, I think it really exemplifies the fact that, you know, we see our members as, as um, one and the same as our land, right? So there was, there was a practice to really um, connect her and, and root her in our territories. Um, and I, I've seen how that's, um, I guess, how that's been so impactful in, in terms of her own identity formation and um, how it's, it's potentially going to build up her resiliency in a way that, you know, I didn't have the opportunity to, to have. So, you know, when we go to our Yinta, she's at a really young age and, and, you know, there are, she's both Lakota and Wet'suwet'en. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of mindful of some of the teachings of, of both of those cultures, but um, I guess from the Lakota teachings, she, she's going to be a spirit uh, up until she's six. So she's going to be very connected um, to the spiritual realm up until she's six. And it's our responsibility as parents, as family, that larger family system to really take care of her and nurture her um, so that she decides to stay on this earth world and doesn't decide to return to the spirit world. So, I mean, I I love the alignment with some of the teachings in in psychology about that critical developmental period up till six, right? And and we know that from psychology, how important that is. And it's, it's just fascinating to me that some of that, um, ancient indigenous knowledge um, and knowing was already there prior to the, the scientific backing, right, of our, our Western um, theologies. But I think, you know, um, it's it's just so clear that she is connected in that way. And I don't know if that's part of what this ceremony, um, like the intrinsic knowing of that ceremony that like literally helps connect a part of her to the land. But I, I saw it from our early visits to our territory that she, um, you know, her babbling and her um, attempts to engage us as, as, um, you know, adults in her life, part of that developmental stage, you know, that we expect that she's going to engage, you know, people in the room and and kind of try try to build that connection, uh, that bond, that attachment. I saw those kinds of behaviors as we were walking through the territory directed um, you know, like she'd increase that babbling and that she almost looked like she was speaking to ancestors on the land. And it was only at the sites within our territory where there historically were pit houses or gathering places um, that our community used. And so, you know, I think about how, um, how important that connection was historically to the land um, for our people and, and how that must have shaped us and made us strong, you know, to know that we aren't ever alone in this world, that we have land to ground us, that we have ancestors behind us, um, and how much um, that prepares an individual to face some of the overwhelming hardships in this experience, and especially for Indigenous people, all of the ways that, you know, um, we, we experience inequities in those social determinants of health, like with poverty, and... Uh, you know, um, I guess it's kind of a, a big issue and I, I don't know if I'm giving it justice, but, you know, just this, I, we're keenly aware that connection to our land and our territory and, and being able to grow up um, to experience that, right, to experience our culture in, in that really rich, direct way where you're trapping on the land, where you're fishing off the land, where you're drinking pristine water from a river um, right on your territory. It, it, uh, it helps keep us grounded and and connected. Um, And, you know, when your individuals and your whole population or your nation is um, still reeling from historic and current experiences with colonization, with disempowerment, um, how important it is to be grounded in something much bigger than ourselves, um, something like the land. Um, 
So, yeah, I, I mean, Frida probably summarizes it um, really nicely in, in some of her quotes and, and just acknowledging that um, when we um, heal the land, we heal our people, right? Like there's there's not really a, a dichotomy seen there, right? Um, right. We are one and the same. Heal the land, heal the people. It's no surprise then that as we experience the stresses of a collapsing global ecosystem, as the biosphere falls apart, that we socially and individually are suffering as well, right? You can almost see the severance of, say, Europeans or settlers, I should say, people that fled Europe especially, their severance from their homeland, from their ancestry, has in turn created some of the problems we're seeing today. And I'm going to try my best to segue into this next segment here, and it is with an interview. This is one of my favorite interviews uh, with Ramon Elani. Uh, he is a heathen writer and poet, and he writes about modernity. He writes about how you know modernity has severed us from the gods. You know, like back with Reed, talking about land spirits, talking about, you know, what the land wants. And when you think about that, what does the land want? What does the land need? What does it need from us? What is our role as a species, as, as human beings? You know, what are we doing here? It isn't to serve this paradigm that we're currently in. That's not what it's about. It's about something else entirely. And so Ramon, he, he was featured in episode 185, the gods have fled the home as a site of defiance against modernity. And in this segment, we discuss his essay, Land, Home, and the Gods. It is a... How would I even describe it? It's something special. <laughs> um, he has a really, really interesting way of looking at things. And uh, in thinking about the land, I, I think about home. And, and I want to ask a question, I guess, regarding what you point out here, which is, you say, the human world is in ruins. It will not get better. The sooner we can withdraw from it, the better. Timothy Leary was right when he urged young people to drop out in 1966. His message is all the more profoundly true today. Life in urban industrial society has no future. The modern world has failed on all, on all levels. Capitalism and industrialism cannot be reformed. The gods have fled. Whether or not we can become completely independent of industrial society is irrelevant. The fact, uh, the fact that it is difficult and perhaps impossible to utterly separate should not be used as an argument against withdrawal. Connection to the gods and the land is ultimately more important than material self-sufficiency. To whatever extent you are compelled and able, withdraw from society and make the home the center of your life. I, I think this is an interesting thing that you bring up because... You're kind of saying, maybe I'm wrong, um, but I feel like a lot of people who are writing about, you know, and the, the sort of the, the depravity or the, the hollowness of industrial modern life of our technological society, there is this sense of like, we need to organize to resist it, to undermine it, you know, whether it's sure. whatever, whatever strain of that you want to go in. Um, uh, but basically, like, we need to, you know, attack the infrastructure, we need to, you know, do all these sure. things, right? And I'm not sure. saying that you're not saying that in maybe other work, but in this particular essay, you're kind of saying, turn your back on this society because it's not going to serve you. It's not going to be fixed. It's not going to be reformed. This is, to use this term, lo the logical conclusion of this this entire experiment that we have been a part of, um, and it's not going to get any better. Um, so the best place to, to dwell is in the home, and we have to first make that home uh, to, to make that possible. If you, I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth or to assume what you believe, um, you know, in, in any of those things I just said, but just kind of reading this piece, there's something a bit, um, kind of took me a little bit aback because again, like I said, most people that are talking about returning to some sort mm -hmm. of pre-industrial, pre-modern, pre-capitalist, pre-Christian, whatever, um, way mm -hmm. of being, way of understanding and, and inhabiting the world, um, there is mm -hmm. this idea of like we have to do this all in sort of some collective sense, but you're kind of pointing to more of a individual choice, and I could be wrong in saying this, but an individual choice we all have to make that 
is in light of what is currently unfolding on this planet. Would you say that my assessment or my understanding is correct or maybe missing certain key yeah, elements? No, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. It's yeah. absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, um, um, I, I've come to these, uh, I've come to where I am as, as a, as a person, you know, um, like everybody through kind of meandering path. And, um, you know, for most of my adult life, I think I would have been horrified to hear myself say that. Um, but, um, but that's no longer the case. Uh, it's, it's taken me a long time, um, or a relatively long time or whatever, but it's taken me some time. Um, but I've, I've absolutely come to the conclusion that, uh, that, um, that, reform is impossible as i've said that that this society cannot and should be not should not be saved and that um our efforts would be better placed doing other things and the suggestion that i'm putting forth in this is make a home for yourself um and and i recognize also that making a home for oneself can mean a lot of different things um so i'm not i'm not trying to be prescriptive in that but absolutely my suggestion here is that um maybe we've got better things to do with our time than to try to save the society. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I am coming to this place maybe personally as well, where I feel like that is at least, if not the whole prescription, it is a part of it. You know, it's like there yeah. has to be a, a base, I guess, or a place to do our work from and mm -hmm. having a home is as we're kind of framing it right now is really the first mm -hmm. major step in that process. Yeah. Yeah. And, and yeah, I mean, I, no, go no, you go on. I'm sorry. Well, I was just going to say that, you know, it's, um, um, it's, it's such a truism that the earth is our home. Um, um, uh, you know, one hears that all the time and one is, uh, is kind of very comfortable with that formulation. But, uh, ironically, as, as we've both observed, uh, nowadays, one very rarely meets somebody whose idea of home is is meaningful to them. So, so that that uh, clearly that's a problem. You know, we um, you know we've we've spent I don't know thirty years, maybe even less, seriously wrestling with the idea of of destroying the earth, um, and yet I don't think very many people have a clear sense of. Um, why it should be saved or what that means that it should be saved people are people are very good at responding to things that are kind of immediately threatening them which is which is obviously important and that's why you know um if you're if you're under attack resistance is uh is of course understandable and and you know i'm i'm obviously not suggesting that those who are who are attacked should not resist but um but it's always been very funny to me that you know um here we are saying that the earth is our home, so we should protect it. But if our home, as as we know it, is just this meaningless place where we dump our possessions, then why why is it important to say that? That doesn't sound yeah. very, you know, that doesn't sound very valuable, right? So I think that um, uh, that's why I think that really, you know, the problem is a is a spiritual one. The problem is one that's really about the home and about that connection to the earth. And that's, that's something that, um, that the individual has to sort out uh, for themselves. You know, some people would argue that retreating from society is not going to help anybody. And, you know, I'm of two minds when it comes to this. I see the value of what Ramon is putting forward, which is we don't even treat our homes as sacred how can we even approach treating the earth as sacred pointing to dr carla tate with the unistoten healing center this is about finding those places and protecting what is sacred and recognizing what the home is knowing what you can do with where you are at don't have these grand illusions that you can change everything and obviously you you might you know you can but you can, you can only do what you can and you might as well make a home. And I mean a real home in the sense that Ramon is discussing a place where the gods can dwell. That is hugely important in this time. That is some of the sacred work that is required. So I, I, I really love that essay that, uh, Ramon, uh, published through gods and radicals. 
Uh, I'm going to move on to another writer for Gods and Radicals. This is like Gods and Radicals all-star shit. Jesus. Um, the next one, though, is with John Halstead. John, I have interviewed him for episode 148, The Dying God, Learning to Die in the Anthropocene. He re- released a two-part essay, What If It's Already Too Late, Being an Activist in the Anthropocene, and Die Early and Often, Being at Us in the Anthropocene. What I really liked and what I think a lot of people really liked about John's two-part essay was, one, he is coming at the, the realization that our civilization is meeting its end. He then uh, writes about this in the first act, and then he gets into the second act, which is more about the myth of the dying god. He describes how pagan mythology, these old, old stories, can help us understand the cycles of life and death. And through this sort of mythic cosmic understanding of how life and death works we can maybe approach something like acceptance and understanding about the predicament that we're all collectively in and i think this is really valuable because we don't really have i mean we we have language to describe to a certain degree what we're what's happening but we really lack the archetypes in our culture to really approach this subject with the sense of like cultural maturity I still nevertheless think that there are a lot of um, resources that can be drawn, symbolic resources that can be drawn on um, under these circumstances from a variety of religions, including paganism. So one of those, paganism, if I was just going to speak in general terms, is a religion that looks back to pre-Christian religion and myths and draws on those myths and those practices and those rituals in a creative way and puts them together in a creative way to deal with modern problems. And different, you know, there's as much variety among pagans as there is among Christians, so you can't really generalize very much. But um, depending on the type of paganism you're talking about, there's going to be more or less, um, you know, creativeness in the, in the um, you know, in, in drawing on these ancient sources. So one of them, one of these one of these symbolic concepts that drew me to paganism that I really responded to was um, the myth of the dying God. And this is what I talk about in the second part of the article, the second article. And the dying God myth, actually, it's really, although there are ancient examples of it, and Attis, which is the is the name of, uh, of an ancient God, he's, he's the name in the, in the title of the article. He's an example of a dying God, but uh, although there, there are examples of dying gods in ancient paganism, the, the idea, this archetype of the dying god was really an invention of the late 19th century. It's an invention of James Frazier, who wrote The Golden Bow. And Frazier's um, uh, unstated goal in uh, writing about the dying god was actually to debunk Christianity. He wanted to show all these ancient examples of gods that died, you know, and and therefore, he wanted to imply uh, that Christianity was bunk because look at all these uh, ancient pagan religions that had dying gods, and the Christ figure is just another one of these ancient dying gods. Actually, people still make this argument today. Uh, the argument didn't really work out because Christians looked at it and just said, well, that's great. Look at all these you know, precursors, like symbolic intimations or, or like prophetic suggestions of Christ, who is the the culmination of all these uh, figures. And then pagans, contemporary pagans, looked at it and just said, oh, it's all great. You know, um, we'll we'll take it all. We'll take the Christ figure and we'll take all these other uh, dying God figures and we'll we'll, um, we'll use all these symbols. And um, so the basic idea of the dying God in its modern form is that... um, I'll just kind of tell the story. There's a there's a god who was born on the winter solstice to the goddess, and his uh, over the course of an, one year he matures, um, mates with the goddess, um, and then is in some form or another killed and dies, and then is later either reborn or reborn in the form of his offspring or something like this. And the, the underlying, and this happens, you know, in the in the winter solstice, he is he's he's born, and then in the springtime he grows up, and in the summer 
um, makes love to the goddess, and in the fall is is sacrificed, and and then uh, and then is reborn again in the winter. So this, you know, from that perspective, when you when you describe it that way, you think, well, what does that have to do with climate change? What does that have to do with really anything? The underlying message of that story is that death is a part of life. It is a necessary part of life. And without death, you don't get life. Um, and this is very literally true. And you think, you know, if you've ever composted, you know, you then you, you've experienced this in a very visceral way. Death, you, you, you know, life feeds on death. And this, this story, this myth is very different than the story or the myth which is driving our culture you know our culture is is built on this myth of progress we you know there's there's no death we are just continually triumphing one triumph over the other you know uh, battling back the forces of nature uh, left and right <coughs> and this this myth, I think, presents a very different paradigm for 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 our society. And when <coughs> excuse me, when I when I'm thinking about what do we do in the face of climate change? What do we do in the face of the fact that we very may very well uh, not survive as a species? It, it occurred to me that. Well, this myth of the dying god offers at least some resources for thinking about that. And and uh, what what the myth of the dying god tells me under these circumstances is um, that, of course, we're going to die. Uh, we were always going to die, even if you know you want to project it out as far as possible. Even if humanity survived. A millennia uh, or, or eons, eventually our sun will burn out, you know, and we, every, you know, every other species has at some point passed away and it is tragic. You know, that, that's a part of the story of the myth of the dying God. It doesn't diminish the tragicness of the sacrifice, the tragicness of death, but there's also the fact that, um, you know, it's unavoidable and we have one of two responses to this reality. One is to embrace it, or one is to deny it. And our society has, the, you know, by following this, this myth of progress, um, we have been on a track of denial. We deny um, our, own, our own mortality in, a, in myriad ways. We deny our collective uh, mortality by, in, in fact, um, you can think of human civilization in a way as one as a, a giant exercise in denying our mortality. Um, I tell this story in the in the article about my son when he was thirteen. He was starting to question Mormonism, and um, among other things, the thing is the thing that was really stressed about or distressed about was the possibility that he was going to die. And, you know, I, I tried to help him through it as, mu as best as I could because I myself don't believe in an afterlife. And um, uh, but I tried to help him come to terms with it. And, and what, where he came to rest is kind of where I came to rest and a lot of atheists and uh, religious naturalists that I know come to rest. And that is, well, we're going to die, but at least, you know, at least our civilization is will continue to carry on and progress and, and you know, and the accumulated knowledge of all humanity and we'll just keep rising and rising and rising. And, um, that's not true either. You know, it turns out that's, uh, that's a myth. Uh, well, every civilization before us has died, uh, and ours is going to die too. The real tragedy is that ours is going to die in a, in a spectacularly destructive way. You know, no, we're not just going to take out, um, you know, some local bioregion or the, you know, the Nile Delta, we're going to take out the planet, a good part of the planet, 
life is going to survive, but we're going to take out a good part of, of biological diversity on our way out the door. And that's, that's a whole new level of tragedy, but um, in accepting it and then figuring out a way to, to live meaningfully in the context of that acceptance, I think that's, that's the challenge that we have. And I think that's, for me, that's, that's one, the, the myth of the dying God helps me um, hold that truth before me and look at it and, and then um, consider how to, be, how to live meaningfully in, the, in that context. We are a storytelling species. We have narratives to explain why everything is happening in the way that it is, whether it's true or not, or whether it's true enough or not true enough. In a way, this is, is exceptionally potent with the work of Charles Eisenstein. Charles has been incredibly influential in my thinking, in approaching the situation that we're all collectively experiencing in a way that is, I guess you could describe it as optimistic. And, you know, I, I am always, this is the thing about doing this project, is I am curious about many, many different people. And as you have already listened to, I've, I've sampled the various interviews that I've had up to this point. And I have a lot of interest, I guess, or I have a lot of interest in a lot of different perspectives regarding the predicament that we're in collectively. Now, I want to pose this. I want to present Charles' view on this. Charles was featured in episode 141, Initiation, A New Story of Climate. And he is the author of numerous books, some of my favorite books, including Sacred Economics, The More Beautiful World Our Hearts Know is Possible, and most recently, Climate, A New Story, which was the focus of that interview. He frames what is currently happening within the process of initiation. As in, our species is going through a process of looking back at the world that has created us with new eyes. That what is currently unfolding on this planet is, as I said, an, an initiatory process. Now, I don't know fully what to make of this. I, I don't disagree with him. I just think sometimes the initiation can kill us. You know, initiation being a, a very purposeful process to say for instance in a traditional culture uh, young men would have or young boys would be put through an initiation process to becoming men women go through an initiatory process it is partly biological but mainly it is cultural it is something that the society the collective the group the elders i would even say it is a process in which to bring us to our fullest potential and to break through uh to adulthood and we can think of what's happening on this planet right now, that we are a species that is going through that process, that we are learning, again, what our real role is, what our obligations are as a species. And we may have to experience the tragic, grief-inducing losses. And, you know, and, and, and I have, I don't know what to make of all of this. I, doing this work, doing this podcast, I have to say, Charles and his ideas are always there in the back of my mind. And in my heart, reminding me, this isn't what you think it is. We don't know what the hell is going on. And certainly we can draw conclusions from the science surrounding abrupt climate change. As I mentioned previously, it is so much about the narrative that we tell ourselves. There are forces outside of humanity that are shaping our, our existence on this planet and the trajectory that we are heading in. Okay, so some people say... Um, it's not about saving the planet. The planet will be fine. It's only a matter of will human beings survive or not. And I think that that is a profoundly mistaken viewpoint because the, the planet created us for a reason, just like all species. All species have a role to play in the maintenance of the whole and the development of the whole. This is a, a, a almost universal, as far as I know, it's a universal indigenous view that there is no superfluous species. There is no accidental species. 
but it is a community of life and everybody has a gift to give toward toward something toward either the the health or the survival or the integrity or the evolution uh, the fulfillment of the dream of the land every species is necessary unique and bears a gift and human beings are the same that and that we were born on this planet to fulfill to serve a purpose and that all of the gifts that we have are relevant to that purpose. So we have gone through this um, project, this project <laughs> called civilization, this, this phase of history for five or 10,000 years in which we have exercised and developed the uniquely human gifts that we have. In a word, technology, or among many of them, technology. So, if and, and and the conditions for us to develop these gifts have been laid down, the planet has, has laid down the conditions necessary for us to develop these gifts for hundreds of millions of years, laying down the fossil fuels, for example, um, the deposits of metal ores and things like that, like the 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 wealth of life to sustain us in a growth phase. Like everything has been perfectly set. The table has been perfectly set for the feast of civilization in which we have developed to a very high degree our uniquely human gifts. The thing is, and this is fine, okay, um, it's it, and, and necessary. We have not yet, however, um, grown into the proper expression, the right expression of our gifts. We have not yet discovered why we have these gifts, what they are for, what for what purpose the planet created us as human beings. We don't know yet, but that is the question to ask. And even to ask that question is new for civilization. Because in the past, we just assumed you know, be, fruit, be fruitful and multiply, and the earth is here for us. We never thought in terms of what is the service we are here called to do, a service beyond ourselves. So that is the right question to ask. And I am certain that, uh, that, that part of the process of discovering the answer to that is to serve an intermediary purpose, an intermediate purpose, uh, which is the healing of the damage that has been wrought, uh, the 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 first step of of a relationship of partnership, creative partnership, is to is to establish trust. <laughs> How about um, you know we've done a lot of damage, and to say now we want to work together with you, you meaning the totality of life on Earth. A courtship is necessary where we we demonstrate our willingness to be in partnership. So I think that in, in the next stage of civilization, our common purpose, our collective aim, our unifying story is the regeneration, the repair, the healing of the biosphere. It is not our final purpose because the purpose of life is not simply to survive, but it is the next step that, that can organize human beings. You know, we, we had a story that organized human beings and made sense of life. It was contributing to the progress of, to, to progress, to, to the conquest of nature, to the ascendancy of human beings. Like this was something that within the dominant society, pretty much everyone agreed on, it gave meaning to life. What, what it it, it um, told us what a worthwhile life was. You would become a scientist. You would become an engineer. You would become a doctor to keep everybody healthy so that they could do this. You know, you'd become a lawyer, greasing the wheels of the machine. Like everybody had a role to play in the grand project of civilization. And now that that story is disintegrating, people are many of the, many 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 people are facing a crisis of meaning, and. Um, an aimlessness. The aimlessness taps into a collective aimlessness in which we no longer believe in the story that carried us. 
And this is the space between stories that you had mentioned before. Yeah. So, so yeah. So, you know, in, to make a, a long story short, uh, yes, we are here. There is a plan, so to speak, uh, or shall we say a purpose or a dream or a possibility that may be fulfilled that calls to us. We are not an accidental species. And uh, I'm on my brother's farm here. That's why there's a rooster in the background. But <laughs> yes, we're not an accidental species. And the time has come to really start asking why we are here. What is a human being for? And this is kind of where my differences, I guess, with many of the conclusions that people have about what climate change means, what climate change is for, what we're here for. Now, I, I may be fatalistic. I, I do believe that we're coming up against too many limits. I think that we may be facing our extinction. That's very real, and I do believe in that. But that's not why we're here as a species. You know, I, I look to the way other people have been living on this planet, and I see, no, actually, human beings are here for just as much as any other reason. I mean, we're here just as much as there is a, a reason for bears to be here or the fish, the infinite variety of fish. You know, we all serve an ecological purpose. We all serve a creative function within the dream of the land, as Charles frames it. The problem, the sad, sad problem, the sad, sad thing is it may be too late and I open my heart to that possibility just as much as I'm open to the possibility of what Charles is presenting in his work. I don't know. You know, I, 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 I don't want to give people false hope, but I also don't want to pretend that I don't feel the things that I feel or know the things that I know. So then uh, I want to move into this next segment, and there's two more left, just so you're aware. Uh, there's two more segments here, and, and the next one is going to be with Joe Brewer. Uh, this is going to be from my second interview with Joe. He was featured in episode 193, Invisible Sacred Work, The Management of Planetary Collapse. And Joe describes himself as a change strategist, complexity researcher, cognitive scientist, and evangelist for the field of cultural design. And what I'm going to present here is a segment of our discussion that really has stayed with me. Joe and I talked about how realistically we are coming up against these limits that we may not be able to recover from. Joe is incredible. I'm so happy to have gotten in contact with this human being who, in spite of all that he knows and understands about not only the ecological crisis, but what human beings are and what we do. He understands how cultures work. He understands how societies function. He understands how to create, or at least he understands enough to work on creating new cultural frameworks that we can operate within. You know, you can't expect that we can actually heal our relationship with the land, with the earth, unless we develop cultures that are aligned with them. And in our current capitalist system, we are not. So Joe, with his family, they moved to Costa Rica, and they are working on building regenerative hubs. This is like the invisible, as the title of the episode that I did with him, this is the invisible sacred work that is happening right now. Kind of like at the very beginning of the episode, I featured that call with Peter. There are people that walk among us that know, that understand. And as Joe frames it in this segment, do the work that we that we know is sacred in spite of the outcome. That point is so important that uh, I sometimes describe myself as an optimistic realist and that I try to be very realistic. And at the same time, I, I'm more inclined toward optimism than depression. But in an interesting way, it's been my optimism that has enabled me to see clearly into the planetary collapse that we're now in, and in some senses, emotionally, to be able to accept its reality. So I've come to positions that some people might call pessimistic, but I would actually say 
I'm being very realistic about these challenges, and I'm still trying to find something worthy of our hope. And uh, and that word worthy is really important because empiricism really only applies to the past up to the present, and uh, we don't have empirical data for the future yet. So there are still things we can do, but for important um, reasons having to do with what we know about reality, there are some things that we can't avoid in the future, and we need to be very realistic about those things. Yeah, you describe... um often what your work is, is managing planetary collapse, I believe is how you've described it. Like managing, like knowing that we're going to collapse, that you don't have this unrealistic optimism. You have a very pragmatic, very realistic understanding of where we are at and where we are likely heading. And then you're like, okay, well, that's the case. So how can we manage this collapse so that we, I guess, move into something far better, potentially, you know, as a species? How can we use this moment that we're in collectively to build systems and cultures um, that are regenerative, that are healthy, that put human beings in right relationship with the planet again. Um, that, that to me is the big takeaway that I get from reading your, your essays and, and listening to you talk about these types of uh, these subjects um, is it like I've been, I don't know if I've been accused, but I think often when I do talk about the kind of dire quality or the dire nature of the time we're in, people can look at it like you're being very pessimistic. And I'm like, we have to have a very grounded, realistic understanding and perception of where we are at right now before we even ask the right questions and make the right um, decisions, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's where you're coming from. That's where you're coming from. Yeah, I'm very much coming from the point of view that... uh, the possibility of humanity coming out better on the other side of this is low probability. And so we have to do our very best and our very hardest work to take that low probability and eventually make it a high probability so that the sequence of steps between here and that future, every step of the way we need to be as effective as we possibly can And that requires us to work with what is actually happening, not with some mythology about what's happening that our mind has constructed for psychologically defensive reasons. We need to look with authenticity at the world and act accordingly. Act accordingly. What does that mean? I don't know. (laughs) I've done 200 episodes and I I don't know. (laughs) I'm still figuring it out. And I, I, I look to people like Joe to provide some meaningful perspective on that. Joe's inspiring. I I look to him and many other people as a beacon of, I, I hate using the word hope, but it's something like hope. It's not, it's not hope that we're going to get out of this. It's not hope that we're going to be saved. That's not what I'm trying to pitch. I hope that's understood by this point. I just want everybody who understands what's happening, we can find each other and we can try our best to do what we can in the time that we have. Connect to the land. Find your home. Make your home. Do the sacred work. Resist. Do something. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm constantly trying to work this out in my mind. And I, this podcast has been a means for me to explore these ideas. And the fact that you all have come on this journey with me up to this point is amazing. And so I want to tie this into the last, the very last segment here that I'm going to feature. And it is with Bio Akamalafa. And it's from my second interview with him. I deeply appreciate and admire his perspective on these things that he's come to, the place that he has come to with his work. And I felt like it was appropriate that the very last segment would feature one of his kind of perplexing riddles, if I could say it that way. I featured him in episode 179, We Will Not Arrive Intact. The times are urgent. Let's slow down. I feel like it was an appropriate way to end this thing, this highlight reel, this mixtape, whatever the fuck this is. Uh, you know, Bio, he is a lecturer, activist, and the author of These Wild Beyond Our Fences, Letters to My Daughter on Humanity's Search for Home. I 
was very fortunate to go and meet him in Salt Lake City. I think it was last month or the month before. I can't remember. I'm losing track of time now. Met him there and um, had a really great experience talking with him. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get an interview with him at the time, but uh, hey, you know, maybe next time. But I hope you can understand what he's saying in this interview. I really love the man. So, Bio, I, I appreciate who you are and what you're doing in this time. It's important. Our ideas and our plans of what is happening right now is so outside of our comprehension. And I talk about colonization and, and decolonization, um, capitalism, you know, radical political theory. I get into all these different territories, and it can get to be a place where I feel like, um, I, I don't know how to maybe say it exactly, but it's, it is overwhelming to maybe view it through those that lens all the time to sort of yeah. f- feel like I'm maybe not intimately, but almost intellectually and emotionally up against something that I can't quite get my hands around or my, my, my mind around. I, I can't quite, even as much as I talk about it all the time, um, it, 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 it still is hard for me to like really comprehend all the things that are happening right now. Um, right. It's, it's almost too much. Um, and, I think being pulled, you know, having this thought, like, I need to talk to bio again, because (laughs) you have um, a way of grounding, at least me, and I think you do that with so many other people as well, you tend to ground people in, in what's valuable, what's important, and, and, um, you know, reminding people, as you say, to, you know, the times are urgent, but, you know, we need to slow down. Um, So I, I, you know, it's something I, I, and I was trying to figure out how to approach this conversation with you because when I read your essays and I watch your your talks and your interviews, um, certainly something that doesn't come to my mind are direct questions. <laughs> For some reason, I can't just list out a bunch of like, what do you think about this subject or this subject or this subject? Um, uh-huh. More than anything, I think if I just sort of feed you an idea, like it'll lead us to some place that I think we can find something really fruitful. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, and and so I, I guess to ask maybe a question is, you know, I mentioned this sort of overwhelming feeling that I think many people, especially those that listen to my po- podcast, I think are feeling emotionally overwhelmed. Um, intellectually overwhelmed, uh, maybe physically as well, depending on where they live in the world, regarding this word we would use, the Anthropocene. Um, Feeling like we're in this human-centered world and we don't know how to get away from that. Um, uh, You know, how do you approach this subject when somebody like me asks you, how how, how do we kind of try to understand this moment that we're in collectively? Um, Where would you begin in, in talking about that? Hmm. Um, well, let, let me let me put it this way: that I feel that first and foremost, I think um, that we are in. Uh, I'm I'm usually very hesitant to create uh, an easy, convenient narrative, like this is the age of this, and therefore this is why we experience this, or this is the age of that, and and that's the reason why we're not experiencing this at the moment. Um, sometimes it's disingenuous and um, just uh, overreaching. But at, at, at this point in time, I actually feel that there are certain dynamics in our globalizing civilization that is creating the affect, the feeling, the sensation, the, the grounded, embodied feeling of overwhelm. And, and maybe that's because we are collectively in a sense, and this we must be nuanced. It's not monolithic, it's heterogeneous. Um, this we that I speak of seems to be experiencing or coming to the end of the project of modern man, the indexing man, the, the one who wields the weapon of language and tries to reduce and encode all of reality in one fell swoop. Um, and it seems ironically, in responding to this question, that we're trying to do it again. <laughs> Basically, it's uh, the, we, the, w- one of the, uh, the DNA of modernity, basically, is that if we give it a shot, we could actually understand everything 
that there is no place that is sacrosanct. There is no place that is too sacred that we cannot go to. There is no, there is no mountain we cannot level. There is no tree we cannot remove to plant our highways. Um, and the universe is just this place waiting for us to, um, um, to discover it, basically, to put it in a family way, to index it, to finally categorize it and say, yeah, we've got this one in the kitty. We have this one in the bag. And this manifests in the architecture of our society, in the ways that we frame work, in the ways we think about education, in the ways we think about citizenship, even in the ways, most ironically, we think about justice. It's, 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 it's representationalism. It's, it's, our, it's this mirror image that if we are, if we are, um, if we are pure on the inside, for instance, we, the world will straighten itself on the outside. It's, uh, be who you want to be, and the world would kind of follow suit, if you will. It's this binary, binarizing, dualistic thing that enforces and commends to us righteousness uh, that says we should be good people. And to be good, if we're good people, then maybe we won't be suffering from climate, from climate change. If we're good people, maybe um, black people won't be shot on the streets. If we're good people, all of this won't be happening. So there's this burden of righteousness. There's this burden to continue to index further and further. And it seems um, like we're not maybe facing the inhospitality, the, which is, you know, the, in, in my opinion, the world is in some senses hospitable and also in many senses inhospitable. Um, it, it will not bend all the time. It will not give way all the time. It will resist. It will push back. But us, as we are blind, modern citizens, just stating in modernity, we are continually pushing. We're continually looking for the, um, the, the what's that, the, the golden fleece. You know, if you chuck in any of your mythological artifacts in here, we're looking for, we're looking for a way to just finally arrive. And even speaking right now with you, I'm also on that ironic journey of trying to figure things out, of trying to balance things. We, tr we, we tend to find new ways of expressing this ontological impossibility of balancing, of arriving, of noticing the world differently, of, of being good people, of finally becoming true. And all of this, I feel, is, is, um, is something that defeats us. It, it overwhelms us. And so what I like to say to people is, well, apart from the shrug of the shoulder, which is rich philosophy, in my opinion, um, apart from the, sh the shrug of the shoulder, um, we, are, we are being defeated in a way. And we, are, we live and thrive in the orbit of other beings that are greater than us. Um, and if we have to meet a world if we have to actually come to terms with a world that is greater than us, then we have to stop thinking in terms of the of anthropocentricity, of human centeredness. We have to learn to compost ourselves. This will not make us righteous. This will not address those political uh, hot button issues like representation or the Me Too movement. It will not always satisfy everyone. We will be offended most of the time. But here is the deal. The world is messy. It's incredibly messy. That is not a justification for not doing all we can, but it is maybe a shocking reminder that we're not going to finally get this together, that we are limited, we are embedded. And yeah, I think I'll just stop it there. I'm trying to put a new bow on something that cannot be easily resolved or concluded. Thank you all so much for making your way through this this thing, this episode. I, I really, really appreciate it. As I mentioned at the very beginning, I will be taking three weeks off. And I'm going to take that time to really reflect on this podcast, this project, what it means to me, what it means to other people. Um, I will be in contact. If you need anything, please email me. 
Um, uh, I'll be still be on social media and all of that. Um, but I'll just be taking a little time away to really reflect on what this project means to me. Um, it's transformed. It's become something far more than I could have ever imagined. And that's all because of you. You, the listeners, you, the people that are interested in these morbid, depressing subjects, these rather strange topics. Thank you for, for carrying this weight, for, for allowing me to enter into your lives in some small way. Thank you so much. I wish you all the best in these coming weeks. Things are changing rapidly, and I hope in the next three weeks that things don't fall apart. <laughs> I'm sure they won't, but, you know, things are, are, are getting a little, a little hairy out there with all that's happening. So um, I'll be back with episode 201, and we will get back into the flow of things. I'll be interviewing people again. I might be restructuring the podcast slightly and how I present it. I think I might uh, abandon some of the things I've done with the introductions a little bit. Not the drop me a line calls, but like some of the ways I've presented the introductions. I think I'm at a point where I really don't need to remind everybody constantly about supporting me on Patreon. If you want to do that, you can find a way to do that. It's pretty pretty apparent to anybody that's uh, able to do that, they can do that. So yeah, I, I, I just want to thank every single person that I've interviewed these past 100 or so episodes thank you even the people that i've decided not to uh feature any longer thank you even if there's all of the kinds of weird shit that's happened in your life thank you thank you so much see you in a few weeks i love you all thank you thank you for making this possible Thank you for listening to Last Born in the Wilderness. Have a wonderful week. And as a psychedelic bard, Terrence McKenna said, Take it easy, dude. But take it. <laughs> I think that was the winner. That was it. Thank you for listening to Last Born in the Wilderness. Have a wonderful week. And as a psychedelic bard, Terrence McKenna said, Take it easy, dude. But take it. Is that it? That's okay. Okay. We'll make it better. Take it easy, dude. But take it. Take it easy, dude. But take it. Yeah. Can't you say that? Sure. Just do whatever you want. Thank you for listening to Last Born in the Wilderness. Have a wonderful week, and as a psychedelic bard, Terrence McKenna said, Take it easy, dude, but take it. That's it. <laughs>